Sooner or later, no matter how beautiful the minds are, you're going to yearn for someone who looks like yourself, someone who isn't ugly. Ugly? What is ugly? Who is to say whether Carlos is too ugly to bear or too beautiful to bear? Bridge to all debts. Welcome to a brand new episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm Steve Morris, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome back our one of our favorite guests. I am so thrilled as well to welcome back aboard Enterprise Incidents, director Ralph Sinensky for the sixth episode he directed. This is absolutely one of my favorites. Steve, I know you love this one too. There is a beauty to Is There in Truth No Beauty that makes this episode stand out as one of the absolute high points of season three, and especially so after doing my research for this deep dive conversation and rewatching the episode for the first time in quite some time, I have come to love it even more, and I did not think that was possible. Also, some some revelations about this episode that I know Steve and I are really going to enjoy getting into. Steve, uh, how how have you felt about this episode over these years? Um, I always liked it. It also always had elements that made me uncomfortable because it's kind of stressful. This this episode, and, but it also it's funny. This is when I feel like didn't play nearly as well to me when I was a kid and plays better and better for me as a grown up. That is absolutely true. And what a coincidence that that very same assessment, Steve, that you have about is there in truth no beauty? Not only do I feel the same way, you know, as a as a kid growing up, I I liked it very much, but it's one that I've had to grow into and I it is one that I appreciate for so many reasons now. It's one that I've I've grown to love even more and more over the years, just like another episode that Ralph directed that he joined us for. Of course, I'm talking about my all-time favorite, Metamorphosis. And I never realized, I have to say, I never realized how much is there in truth no beauty actually has in common with metamorphosis. And we will get into that. But my first question for you, Ralph, is, is when the time came for you to direct, is there in truth no beauty? This was your 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 the first episode that you directed for season three. And and so what was your take on, on the story, on the screenplay and all that? Well, before we start, I do have to say, and I want to quote Betty Davis's Margot Channing line from All About Eve, fasten your seatbelts, <laughs> it's going to be a bumpy dive. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes, uh, for, I'm, for I'm that. Just, uh, I'm warning, I'm warning. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Look, uh, ultimately, no matter how bumpy this dive gets, Ralph, the bottom line, the takeaway is the episode itself. And the episode itself is glorious. It is beautiful. It is it is a perfect, dare I say the word, companion episode to Metamorphosis. <laughs> Not I, subtle I about that. On my uh, website, on the post I did on this, I did say at the end that there were some changes made in post-production that I think harmed it for me but if those changes had been not been made i think the episode is almost as good and maybe as good as metamorphosis uh, i i agree and certainly the the one episode of season three that moves me continually even after seeing it multiple times as much as metamorphosis does every time i watch it i still it brings all the feels and and that is a testament to the power of the story and and yeah. and i'm sure steve will agree with this and steve i'm i'm curious to hear what you think of of ralph's inspired directing choices throughout this episode i mean your touch on this episode so many of the decisions you made especially when it came to using the fisheye lens really make this episode quite unique i agree <laughs> as usual <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i think there's a there's more to talk about in terms of direction for me in this episode than almost any other episode of the original series there's so many choices that are unique 
to this episode? Well, this episode in particular, so we're talking about a bottle show where the all the action takes place on the Enterprise on stage nine, uh, to be specific. And I have to say, and this is a, this is a revelation I definitely had rewatching this, uh, Ralph, is that next to Spectre of the Gun, which was the first episode shot for season three, the cinematography for this episode, uh, Jerry Finnerman's cinematography for Is There and Truth No Beauty is absolutely gorgeous. I agree. It is, uh, it is one of the very, very best shot episodes of the third season. In fact, the lighting, the cinematography is so, so strong that you could put Is There and Truth No Beauty in the middle of like maybe the the second season, like right around like the midpoint of the second season, and it, it would fit right in. And the George Dunning, who scored your last episode, Return to Tomorrow, as well as Metamorphosis, returns for a, a breathtaking, a breathtaking and deeply moving, soaring score that is 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 up there with Metamorphosis. And and you know another revelation during just doing these deep dives. Uh, uh, with Steve on Enterprise Incidents and, the, and having you join us once again, Ralph, is that you really were like the best director for sensitive, moving romances and love stories. And, and the way you directed the female guest stars was was just really, really fantastic. It, looking back, was that something that that you feel like particularly proud of is, is, you know, that you got these great performances out of Eleanor Donahue and Diana Muldaur? Yes, as a matter of fact, going back like seven years when I started, in those earliest years, they were writing great women's roles. And I just remember, but but Moss was a, an agent. He represented a couple of the gals that that I used. And I used to think of myself kind of as a pseudo George Cukor television director, because I had Carolyn Jones and Ruth Roman and Beverly Garland. I mean, in, in great, great roles, and they gave great performances. Uh, amazing, really amazing. And, and this is your sixth episode of Star Trek that you directed. The teleplay is by a writer named Jean Lissette Arrest. So Steve, check this out about Jean Lissette Arrest. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. Jean Lissette Arrest knew someone who wrote screenplays for Batman. And she said, hey, I got this great idea for a Star Trek episode. So the friend referred Jean Lissette Arrest's screenplay or, or outline, uh, rather spec script to her agent. The agent forwarded it on to the producers of Star Trek. And the next thing you know, she's writing her very first ever teleplay for a television series. And Arrest also wrote the episode All Our Yesterdays, which is the last truly standout episode of the third season of Star Trek. And those are her only two television credits. She wow. never did anything after Star Trek. Maybe she felt like, I'm good. I don't know. Uh, but her story outline came in on May 7th, 1968. And the title was Miranda. When she revised her story outline by May 24th, the title was changed to Is There in Truth No Beauty? Her first draft teleplay came in on June 18th. Her script polish on July 5th and then Arthur Singer did a script polish, a final draft teleplay on July 12th. Then on July 15th and 16th, Gene Roddenberry did a couple of page revisions. And Ralph, you know where I'm going with this. These page revisions included the idic scene that caused a, a whole lot of drama on the filming of this episode. And well, we'll get to that in a oh, second. Oh, yes. Oh, I know. <laughs> so the air date for Is There in Truth No Beauty was October 18th, 1968. It was the 60th episode to air. It was the 63rd episode to film. And it was shot over seven days. So that means it went one day over schedule. But again, there's a mighty big reason for that. And it was shot between July 16th and July 24th, 1968. But despite going one day over schedule, Ralph, you really brought this episode way under budget. Uh, the total cost was $167,130, which brought it more than 
$5,000 under budget. So kudos, my friend, uh, for bringing it under budget on under trying circumstances. Once again, the score was by George Dunning. And George Dunning recorded his score on September 6th, 1968, the same day that he recorded his score for the very next episode after this, which is The Empath. So he did both of those scores the same day, and both of them are are really unique. Both of them are equally powerful and moving. So here are a few of the things going on in the world while you were filming this episode, Ralph. The first one is, as you said, Scott, is filmed between July 16th and the 24th. On the 17th in Iraq was the July Revolution when the Ba'ath Party overthrew the government. And one of the people participating in that revolution is a young Saddam Hussein. Mm, whoa. You know, Scott, we, I, kept ta- I, I didn't bring up hijacked planes, and now it's happening multiple times a week. There was another flight hijacked to Cuba on the same day, and also on July 17th. Scott, in your world, there is something else that happened. Okay, July 17th, 1968. Yeah. Uh that would I would say that was the recording of uh, Hey Jude. Mm, no. Ah. This one I you missed it. This one is actually Beatles and movies. Oh, wait. Oh, uh uh wait a minute. Uh that would be maybe Yellow Submarine. It is the premiere of Yellow Submarine <laughs> okay. on July 17th. All right. Uh, Thanks for uh, the hint. <laughs> on July 18th, one of the most important companies was in the world was founded, and that was the founding of Intel by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore of Moore's Law. Uh, that was founded the founding of Intel. Uh, James Earl Ray was arrived back in the United States on July 19th. On July 20th, the very first Special Olympics was held. And you know, we were talking about, I said there was lots of hijackings. On July 22nd, Flight 426 from London to Tel Aviv was hijacked by the PLO. Uh, and they, they hijacked it because they believed that General Ariel Sharon was on board. He was not. Oh. Um, and that plane was taken to Algiers, I believe. Um, on the same day, Virginia Slims, the cigarette for women, were, was introduced. Their slogan, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> on July 23rd, and this just made me think of the film Network, is uh, 10 people were killed and 18 people wounded in a battle between the police and a black nationalist group called the Black Nationalists of New Libya. And the leader of that group, Fred Ahmed Evans, which is what made me think of uh, the great Ahmed Khan in the movie Network, said when he was arrested that if his carbine hadn't jammed, he would have killed three more of the police. Wow. And it just, you know, again, I just keep saying the same thing. If we think we're in the world's craziest time right now, no. Things were really, really crazy in 1968 at this time. Um, And now in Algiers, that plane that had been hijacked, it's now five days later. It's on the ground in Algiers. They first released the 16 non-Israeli passengers. Three days later, they release all the Israeli women and children. The rest, the remaining 12 passengers and 10 crew, remained hostages in this plane until September. Wow. Jeez. Yep. That is nuts. On July 26th, the UK announced plans to switch to the metric system by 1975. Today, there are only three countries in the world who have not switched the metric system. They are Liberia, Myanmar, and the United States. So, so that means the uh, uh, they wouldn't know what a royale with cheese is. <laughs> That's true. No, well, no, they would know what a royale with cheese. They wouldn't know what a quarter pounder with cheese. A quarter is. That pounder just doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, at all. right. <laughs> That's a Pulp Fiction reference. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shall we get into the show? As we get into the show, Ralph, as you transition from season two to season three, now this may seem like a loaded question, but what were your first observations when you came back to? Desilu now paramount to to film your first Star Trek episode of season three. Is there in truth no beauty? Well, it was paramount before because it was paramount starting with Bread and Circuses. John Meredith Lucas was gone. Uh, Fred Freiberger was now installed. And I knew going in that it was going to be the last show, the last Star Trek I would be doing with Jerry, Jerry Finnerman. Oh, okay. Mm. I knew that 
because he was signed to do a feature with Sidney Poitier. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which is what he left for. But I knew, I, I don't know whether this was his last one or whether the next one was his last, but I knew it was the last one I would be doing with him. Right, right. So you knew before he actually left that he was he was leaving. And of course, during the prep, it wasn't that much different. But everything started on Tuesday morning when we reported to the set. <laughs> and that was not like anything that had happened on Star Trek before. That's for sure. <laughs> we'll we'll find out why in a bit. <laughs> well, it was the script. And I was just reading, pre-reading Mark Cushman before we started this today, that the dining room scene, which was going to be our first scene, they had gotten a new, I think it was the day before, there had been a new scene written by Gene Roddenberry, introducing into the into the scene uh, the business about the Idic. And Leonard and Bill objected to doing the scene. Leonard, Leonard said that he had contacted Fred Freiberger about changing it, you know, about that he was unhappy with it, and Fre Freiberger would have nothing to do with it. I just read in the Cushman book, he said, uh, you know, the this, this script's fine. I'm working on the new one. Right, right. So that's right. Gene Roddenberry from the set. And Gene came down to the set that morning. I mean, because we, we weren't shooting. And we spent the morning, uh, Gene and the two boys, Leonard and Bill, were at one table. And the rest of the cast and I were off to the side. And we didn't know what was going on, but there was a heated discussion going on there. And then finally, we were notified that Gene was going to go home and do a rewrite on the scene to make it feasible so that we weren't going to shoot it that day. And that was literally scheduled for, for the whole day shooting. I think there were four more short scenes in the corridor that came to about a page and a half. And I didn't want to end up turning in a page and a half for the day. So I went to David and Diana and I asked them if they knew, you know, if if they knew the scene, the, the big scene that they had in her room after after the dining room scene. And both of them said, yes, being the pros that they were, that they had it memorized, but usually what they like to do is memorize it all. And then the night before, do the fine tuning, but they agreed to, to come ahead. And that was what we shot that day. So, so you had to, you know, scramble and re move around scenes on the very first day of filming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, on her television archive interview, Diana Maldar, when she talked about it, she remembers it differently than it happened because she said that the, the first day they threw out the whole script. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The whole thing was just, the, the whole thing to her at that point was just a mess I mean, because nothing was, you know, it was new pages all the time, which was not the case. That was the only thing thrown out. And she did say that when she saw it on the show, she was very happy with the show and couldn't figure out how they'd put it together because it, she, she remembered it as being such a mess to do. Wow. Yeah. So you showed up on the first day. Did, did you know what they were arguing about? Did you know it was about this idic thing? I think, I, not in detail, but yes. Do you know how long you were sitting? <laughs> because sitting on a set oh, and not be able to shoot. It, oh, it, it, it was hours. I mean, I literally lost the morning. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty, because that scene, and we'll get to it when we get there, but that scene that they did, that's not a light acting scene. That you had to pivot to. That's a heavy. Oh, I know it's a, yeah. it's a heavy, heavy scene. And yeah. the fact that those those two people did it with figuring that they wished they had had the night before to prepare it. I can't imagine they're doing it any better than what's on the screen. They did a great job in that scene. Absolutely. I can't wait till we talk about that scene. All right. Well, let's. Uh, why don't we jump into the show? Okay. And obviously, we got some more stuff we're going to get to as we oh, move yes. along. Oh, yes, we are. So in the teaser, the first thing we hear in the log is once again, we're transporting an ambassador, but this time the ambassador is called the Medusan ambassador. And we hear this thing, and I just say, this is like a science fiction idea that its base just sounds really dumb to me. 
but it gets us into a bunch of stuff that I find really interesting, yeah. which is the basic idea is that these Medusans who do, are like non-corporeal, that their physical appearance is so terrible that it will drive you insane if you see it. That's a weird idea. It's, <laughs> and, a, it's a weird idea, but you know, if you go back to Medusa, mm -hmm. that's what would happen or you would turn to stone. Uh, at least that's what happened in Clash of the Titans. Um, but, uh, but you know, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a, a stretch, but okay, that's the premise. That's the setup. That's what this race is. And just, just like in, let's say Steve, just like in, uh, um, Aaron of mercy, we have a race that has evolved beyond the need for physical sustenance that their, their essence is, is what lives, but the sight of the essence is what, is what drives people mad if they, if they look at it with the naked eye. And the first thing that happens, we're in the transporter room, and the ambassador, the Medusa ambassador, doesn't beam aboard. Instead, Larry Marvick beams aboard. Larry Marvick is played by David Franken, who I understand, Ralph, you knew him before. Eight years September. before, I had directed David in a production at the on the main stage of the Pasadena Playhouse of The Circle, starring Estelle Winwood, hmm. who at that point was 78 years old. And Miss Winwood was playing the older woman in the, the story. When the play debuted on Broadway at sometime in the 20s, she was playing the ingenue. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. So, well, well, David Franken was also on TV shows like Matinee Theater, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Thriller, Gomer Pyle, USMC, the FBI. And on film, he was in The Return of the Fly and Master of the World. And also in an episode of 12 O'Clock High, which I also directed him mm. in. So was, I, I, was he a nice guy? Oh, he's wonderful. I, David has been up to visit me here. I've known David now for 62 years. Oh, wow. That's great. That's wow. great. No, he's, he's great and a wonderful actor. Definitely. Um, that's very cool that you're still in touch with him. That's great. And so he beams aboard. And the first reaction he has is, what is Kirk doing here? You cannot be here when the Bedusin ambassador beams aboard. So clearly, this is a really, really dangerous thing. You can't even be in the room when the Medusan shows up. And then he introduces Spock. Mr. Spock, do you have the visor? You must be sure to wear it. Humans who get even a glimpse of Medusans have gone insane. And that's where we first see this pretty cool looking red uh, visor. Uh, we introduce Scotty, who's there. And Scotty says, and we hear it just as they're walking out. Scotty says, it's a rare privilege meeting one of the designers of the Enterprise. OK, so I, I have a question, Steve. So he's one of the designers of the Enterprise. Yes. He looks pretty young. <laughs> and the Enterprise has been in this form now for a while because yeah. uh, even Captain Pike, when he was uh, commanding the Enterprise, it looked much like the version that Kirk is now in command of. So he must have designed the Enterprise when he was like a kid. <laughs> well, I, actually, David is only, I think, four years younger than me. Oh, bless his heart. Or maybe maybe six years. So at that time, he was in his late thirties. Yeah, well, he looks younger than that. I know, I know. Well, and this is, of course, before we had locked down all these timelines <laughs> and really put. Yeah, it's it's you know, nobody thought we were going to pick over these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I know and we are to blame. <laughs> are you sure this visor will work? It has proved effective for Vulcans. It's your human half I'm worried about. I shall endeavor to keep it under control. By the way, with the powerfulness of these Medusans' appearance, I, I would have worried about that human half from what we see later on. Uh, um, I would have worried about it, too. And there is a moment, Steve, and I'll point it out when we get to I it. Know, yes. Yeah. All right. OK, go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, I know the moment. Um, so so Kirk now exits. Uh, Spock puts on the visor. Ralph, everything you did with these red, these red filters, I love how you handled that. Thank you. How did you how did you do that with the red filters over? Was that you? Was that Jerry? It was Jerry. Yeah. In other words, the first time we we do it, the point of view of the stage, and then brought a red filter up in front of the camera, and then held it there, and then took it off as he took off his. Oh, interesting. I like doing it live better than you know the technical way they do it these days. With the computers particularly for this kind of effect the practical effect works way better oh absolutely it's much more interesting to see and your timing is, is is the way it should be and then the transporter is energized and there is 
both the Medusan ambassador, which is like a big box, and Miranda Jones. Well, just some trivia, the container containing the uh, uh, Ambassador Collis was, of course, designed by Matt Jeffries, the set designer. Uh, and so welcome back aboard the Enterprise, Diana Muldaur, for her very for her second episode of Star Trek after Return to Tomorrow. But as it turns out, she was not the first choice to play Miranda. Jessica Walter was the first choice to play Miranda. Jessica Walter, who played William Shatner's wife in the short-lived TV series For the People. And by the way, it's a good thing that show For the People was short-lived because when For the People was canceled, that freed William Shatner up to get cast in a groundbreaking new television series called Star Trek. I'd worked with Jessica earlier that year. We we did in this show in September, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. I had directed Jessica in June of that year in Name of the Game. Oh wow! Which is why I asked for her. Yeah, this was shot in July. So so July. the month before, the month before you shot this, you yeah. had already worked with her. I, yeah, I just worked with Jessica, and uh, but she was not available, and uh, we were looking at uh, the other you know people available, and this role it was more than just a woman's role. I mean, it needed to have stature and distinction, which I, I think some of the women on Star Trek, they're, they're a little young to be playing the roles they're playing. And this was especially difficult. And so I, I suggested, why don't we put a black wig on Diana Muldaur and let's use her. And I've had a lot of comments saying the idea that if you can't use an actress or an actor in another role that they did it all the time as, as if I don't know what I'm talking about. But they did say, but we don't do that. But we couldn't find anybody else. They did agree to do it. And I just think Diana is dynamite in this. She's she's fantastic. And between this and Return to Tomorrow, I think this is the better the better oh, performance. It's better yeah, it's Absolutely. definitely the better I role. totally yep. agree. Yep. Scott, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So you are much better at recognizing faces and details than me. Okay. When you were a kid, did you recognize that this was the same actor? Oh, yes. I definitely did. Sure. I had no idea. Never yeah, occurred yeah. to me. I think her performance is so different. Like, I ne I didn't notice. I was. It, it probably wasn't until I was in high school or maybe even when she showed up on Next Generation that I really knew that, oh, this was two different people. You know? Well, I, I was so young when I saw these episodes for, for the first time. And of course, I, I have pretty vivid memories of, of those days. But one vivid memory, well, two vivid memories that I have. One is that I thought that she was playing the same character, just wearing a different <laughs> outfit. But the other vivid memory that I have is that I used to call this episode, I used to refer to it as, is there no truth in beauty? <laughs> Instead of is there in truth no beauty? So just like who mourns for Adonis and who mourns for Adonai, I got the episode name wrong. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Ambassador Collis. I am First Officer Spock. I'm Dr. Jones. The ambassador is most honored to meet you, Mr. Spock. And he looks over at the box, raises an eyebrow, we push in, and that is the end of the teaser. Not a particularly dramatic teaser, in my opinion. Yeah, you know what, Steve? My notes. It says teaser is okay. Most others were a lot better. Yeah. So we are totally on the same page, but it is worth noting that the teaser and the tag scene, which were filmed in the transporter room, were filmed on the fourth day of production for Is There in Truth No Beauty? That was Friday, July 19th, when these scenes in the transporter room were shot. And I bring this up because that very same day on July 19th, Metamorphosis was rerun on NBC that night. Oh. Uh-huh. Good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> this is Captain Kirk to all ship's personnel. Clear passageways immediately. The ambassador will be escorted to his quarters at once. And we watch what seemed like a fair amount of ex extras for season three clear out those corridors. And Ralph, I had a question for you about this. Yes. How many corridors were actually built that you shot in? Just the one. Because you did a beautiful job shooting it. 
How do you approach making it look like it's more than one uh, corridor? Uh, I would have liked to have done a two shot of them going from the turbo lift to Collis's room, but it, it, was, it wasn't long enough. So I did shot where they came out of the turbo lift. It exited the camera. I think the, the box went over the camera. And then I went into individual close-ups. And then we did at least three and possibly four in order to, to get the whole scene. Now, was this one of the scenes throughout that you shot on that first day when? Oh, no, I, I'm not sure what day we shot this, but it was not on the, the first day was, no, I, I no, I, I wouldn't have done this on the first day. I don't think. I, right. I, I think I did this, the shot of the, the crew leaving. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. We'd have to. Yeah. Check this I, what's worth, it's worth noting that one of the flaws of the third season overall was that because the budget was cut so severely was that they couldn't hire extras to right. walk around the corridors of the enterprise. And it just looked like Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Scotty were the only people <laughs> on the enterprise. Um, but for this scene, you actually had some extras, you know, uh, kind of. I, I think they're, they're, they're the two shots. And I think there are, I think eight people in each shot. That's Seven right. People in each shot. Well, just, just FYI, Steve, the the title of this episode is, Is There in Truth No Beauty? And it has a question mark in the title. So this is the third episode of Star Trek to have a question mark in the title. So Steve uh -huh. Morris, do you know the other two episodes that had a question mark in the title? I don't. I don't. Okay. Sorry. You're going you're gonna to go, oh, yes, when you're here. I'm so sure I will. The first is, what are little girls made of? Of course, yes, yeah. <laughs> and the other is, who mourns for Adonais? <laughs> <laughs> and the title, Is There and Truth No Beauty, actually comes from a 17th century poem written by George Herbert called Jordan. Line two of that poem says, quote, who says that fictions only and false hair become a verse? Is there in truth no beauty? So there you go. <laughs> All right. Great title, I think. I love the title. It's a really interesting one. Um, so uh, this scene with Spock and uh, Miranda Jones going down the corridor is one I just want to point out because of the writing, which I think is, it really is a good lesson in terms of good writing. We, we talked a lot about the exposition dump that sometimes in Star Trek and in all, all things where you just, I got to get this information out so the audience knows it. When it's done poorly, that's all that's going on. When it's done well, there's emotional character things going on, so you're not aware of the fact that you're getting the exposition. In this scene, as we walk down, Spock congratulates her on assignment. Thank you, but the assignment's not yet definite. It will depend upon my ability to achieve a true mind link with the ambassador. Now that's some exposition. I'm sure you will find it a fascinating experience. And this is where the scene changes. And I think the actors do such a good job because her emotional turn, when he says that, he, she because she thinks that he's saying he's already had a link with the Medusan. And her response is A, exposition. I wasn't aware that anyone had ever achieved a mind link with the Medusans. But more importantly, it reveals her jealousy, is her anxiety, her emotions. It's all these feelings inside of her, and that's what elevates the scene. And this is what makes her character so fascinating to me, is those flaws, those insecurities. And it establishes the relationship between the two of them, because the fact that she asks... I've heard, Mr. Spock, that you turned down the assignment with the ambassador. There is a thing between the two of them that doesn't get resolved until the tag. It really was more than exposition because there's an emotional contact between the two of them. And it will even be have some effect when we get to the dining room scene with the idic. The tension between Spock and, and uh, Miranda, it's really evident throughout the course of the episode, like you said, Ralph, until, until the very end. And both actors, uh, Diana Muldaur and Leonard Nimoy, are terrific. And the interesting thing about... So, so Spock is really just being like, yeah, you know, I, my life is here on the Enterprise. And, and, and she is just very, very jealous because she's threatened. She's yes. threatened by Spock. Because at this point, she, she doesn't have that position yet. She doesn't get that position until she's able to prove that she can do a mind meld 
with Kolos. And so he's still a uh, somebody that is that could take the job away from her. And my thing is that his reaction is that he's aware of that. Yep. He is aware yep. of it. He doesn't have those same feelings, but he's aware of her of her feelings. And and she spent four years on Vulcan and she is still having these very severe human emotions. So, I mean, she's human. She doesn't have that, you know, she can't brag that she's half Vulcan or even a quarter Vulcan, but it is, it, it's worth noting that, you know, here she's bragged about studying on Vulcan and she was there for four years and, and yet she's still, she's still showing these emotions, the, the worst of human emotions. Well, and I think Vulcan probably made it worse because here she was surrounded by all these people. I mean, Spock grew up as a half Vulcan and had problems with his identity. Well, she's a full human. She's, you know, her levels of insecurity are really high. And the thing that I was thinking about is that back in the first season, there were a lot of flawed characters that were good people, but had character cracks that had to be resolved in episodes. People like Bailey and Corbomite or Styles or you know, Gary in um, Where No Man Has Gone Before, is that that's what she is, is that she is a good person, essentially, but with some flaws that could make her a really negative person. And and that's, I find her to be probably maybe the most fascinating character so far in the third season, certainly. Oh, you know, I agree. I agree. That's a, that's a really good way to put it, too. I would appreciate an opportunity to exchange greetings with the ambassador. And there is a pause. Yes. That tension just went up a notch, didn't it? I'm sure the ambassador would be charmed. And it's because, of course, that means that he's going to make mind contact. And I think she is very protective and defensive of her position as the only person who could do that. Not only that, but f f again, fearful that by doing it, that he might mm -hmm. put himself in opposition to her for the position. I think what's really good about this script is there's a whole bunch of subtle stuff that's happening that if you're paying attention should give you clues about things. Kirk was told to leave the transporter room, but Miranda can be there. And now, and, and Spock was told the visors work for Vulcans. And now we're going to look at the ambassador with the visors and Miranda is there wearing a visor. How is that possible? Well, we, we don't know if she's blind yet. Uh, no, I know, but that's what I mean. It's a really good plant a clue that something's different about Miranda that we haven't been aware of when we started. But she had the she had the visor on when they came into the transporter room. Yeah, but visors don't work on humans. That was a front because she didn't want anybody to know that she was blind. I think we're ha I think we're having a confused conversation. So so what I'm saying is that because she is human, the visor should not help her. The reason it's okay. Oh, is that I see she's what you're blind. saying. I see what you're saying. Is that there are these little clues that she is different from Kirk right from the beginning. She's able to be there in the transporter room with the ambassador. She's able to go through the hallways when we had to clear all the hallways. Now that we're going to have the visor on, which we said only works on Vulcans, is that there are all these little clues that, in fact, she's blind, even though we don't know that yet. Right. So what you're saying is that you know, Spock, who was half Vulcan, can get away with wearing the visor. But right. Miranda, who was fully human, Shouldn't should be not able be able to get away with wearing the visor, even though possibly those four years that she spent on Vulcan learning to, you know, uh, sort of compartmentalize her emotions, that won't be enough. I, I That's interesting perspective. Uh, but it, and it, could, it could be her choice to do it to again, to conceal the fact. Sure. Well, she does not want to appear weak, you know, right. at any time. No, she doesn't. <laughs> By the way, Ralph, one thing that occurred to me as I was watching this, I think you hold the record for the director of Star Trek who had to deal with the most blinking light effects. Well, and this is the one that is so wrong, I cannot tell you. You didn't know about those. Uh, that uh, was done post-production, and it's wrong. Why is it wrong? What should it have been? To begin with, it makes it seem as if it's the ambassador doing that, the way we shot it. There were no blinky lights, no animation. I just, I, I get shaky when I even talk about that. But the whole point is that the scene itself is wrong because with the normal light and the reverence, it's, I always compare this scene to the big scene in Lost Horizon with the Ronald Coleman and Sam Jaffe, the, the, the High Lama, that reverential. And that's what this scene is. And that's what the music should have been. So should we have seen nothing? 
Like, what would you have had us see? But the, the whole point is that when they open the door, just his reverence. Just and reaction. It's the reaction. Yeah. Well, one thing we do get is a reaction from Spock. There is a slight flinch when he sees the Medusan ambassador. That's the human half reacting. And the Vulcan half kicks in and gains control. I see, I, I, I never took, took that as being a reaction like uh, to the ugliness, that it was just that it's opening. That That's a, a really a, a strange, difficult moment. I mean, they're playing the monster by doing the animation right. in, in a flickering green light. Oh, I see. And I it, see. This is a sublime, intelligent person, and it's it's looking at him in the wrong way. There should have been reverential, you know, just beautiful music. So you, so you think that the animation actually... Oh, I, 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 I just deplore it. Got it. I understand why. I, I understand. I think this points out, this is this weird thing about this episode, which I genuinely like. But the weird thing is this idea of it's so ugly, it's going to drive you crazy. And I think that concept doesn't really make sense. And because, because I don't think there's anything that I could just see visually that would make me totally permanently insane. That seems like a bizarre thing. And I think what they were trying to do with the animation and with the music is reinforce that idea. I know, and do it with the actors. Well, and what I would say is that instead make the conceit that seeing the, that the Medusans exist on another plane of exist, existence, that they see the universe in four dimensions instead of three or something like that, and that seeing the Medusans clues us into this image of the universe that is not one that we can handle. Our brains aren't capable of comprehending that, and that's what drives you insane. Do you know what I mean? But then we don't get into the beauty and ugliness thing, which I think is interesting in the episode. That's where we differ. See, I, I see that whole society of being formless, they don't speak, and it's beyond imagination. You, you cannot describe or try to show what they are and the fact that they communicate telepathically. No, no, I agree totally with you, oh, yeah. Ralph. I totally agree with you. I, I think it's it's that word ugly that I think is I know, what I know. Yeah, and, we get trapped in. Quite frankly, if you're ugly to the point that you're driving people mad, the, the animation lessens for me, lessens sure. the impact. We do have this moment where Spock greets the Medusan, and then he says, I almost envy you your assignment. I see in your mind that you are tempted to take my place. Wow. Wow. Was that in his mind? I don't think so. No. What was in his mind that she saw? Uh, I think that she she didn't so much see what, what was in his mind. She came to her own conclusion because she's right. so paranoid. I don't think I I genuinely believe that Spock had no ulterior motive with just wanting to say hey to the ambassador. I, I don't think he wants to take her. He doesn't want to well, take her place. He wants to be on the Enterprise. I think Spock might have gone, wow, this is really cool. Like he might have had that reaction and that she then interprets as, oh, he's going to try to take my spot. Right. Not correct, Doctor. Although I am aware of your mind attempting to contact mine. Now, is that a uh, no-no on Vulcan? Oh. That she was trying to reach him telepathically? Well, are Vulcans telepaths? I guess they are. Because of course they are. Because yeah. of the way that, that you know, Spock, like, willed the woman to bring him the communicator in the, the Omega glory. Uh, I guess... I don't know if it's a no no. That's a good question. Think it's, I think it's totally a no no. I think him saying, I was aware of you, your mind tempting to contact mine, I think that's saying, uh, I think it's a slight reproof. That's mm. what I think, in my opinion. Well, um, what, what's interesting to me is that, you know, we're only halfway through the first act and we're seeing that that obsession is such a key theme here in this episode for many reasons. You have, the obsession of Marvik with Miranda. Yes. You have the obsession of Miranda almost with Kalos. You have the paranoia that Miranda feels uh, about Spock, which is, you know, kind of a form of obsession in its own way. And it's it's such a complex episode. There's so much going on. And to me, Spock's reaction to that, it's reaffirming his awareness of her feelings about him. 
Well, it, it's so funny. You remember in our last two episodes, which are weak episodes of Star Trek, yeah. you know, I kept bringing up this thing of it being personal, that good Star Trek episodes have things that are personal. This is personal. Yeah, we have absolutely. real emotions going on here. Spock exits, and then when she's alone with the ambassador, she now takes off that visor and says, what is it he sees when he looks at you? And let me tell you that when he left, the cut to the box was with, without the green light. The box was not open. And the fact that she takes off the visor with the green light, that's starting to clue the blindness. So it gives away too much. Oh, yeah. I mean, the other thing that I wish I had done is that she hadn't said it. She just looks down, sees the box closed, and then looking at it, the, it's voice over saying that line rather than her seeing it. I wish mm. I had done that. Oh, I see. I see. I thought it was going to be a bumpy dive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, speaking of bumpy dives, we've reached the infamous dinner scene. I really like the way you staged this, by the way, Ralph. I think it looks really nice. So we've already talked about this uh, near the top of the conversation that something went down. And this was this was actually on the first day of filming. So there's the Idic Rebellion by Shatner and Nimoy. So this is what the Idic is. It stands for Infinite Diversity, Infinite Combinations. What a beautiful symbol that is. But the motive behind that symbol was this. Gene Roddenberry knew that Star Trek was on its way out. And he wanted to milk as much out of this cash cow that he could and he was more focused on his, his mail order merchandising catalog called, which later became known as Lincoln Enterprises. And in the very first you know, brochure, he had advertised this pendant called the Idic, which was going to be mailed out to fans. And in the, in the catalog, it said, soon to be seen in an upcoming episode of Star Trek. So the inclusion of the Idic was to sell merchandise. That was the motive. That's why Roddenberry wanted it there. And Ralph, when we did our last deep dive in on Spock's brain, like Roddenberry wanted a scene filmed for Spock's brain about the Idic, but they just ran out of time and they couldn't do it. So Roddenberry went to the very next episode, which was yours here, and said, I want this scene in the episode. And Roddenberry himself said, the inclusion of Idic was valid. I truly believe in the statement, the message behind it. Infinite diversity, infinite combinations. Why wouldn't I want that in the show? So Shatner and Nimoy said, we know what's going on here. They read the scene and they're like, wait a minute. We're filming a top quality television series. We're filming art. We're not trying to sell your merchandise. And they said, we are not going to film the scene. So, Ralph, you observed that Roddenberry came to the set and that Shatner and Nimoy were off to the side and, right. and it got heated. And from what I understand, Nimoy was between the two of them a little more heated about, about the conversation. Is that fair we, to say? We, well, we, we really didn't hear them. We were far enough away. And so we, we did not hear what they were saying. We just knew that there was an argument. So when you when the argument was was going on and you're losing precious time filming on your first day, did Fred Freiberger say, you know, like don't worry about it, this is this is nothing to do with you? Like you know that I never met Fred Freiberger till the day he fired me. I did not. Wow. 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 I don't remember meeting him during the show ever. So the question is like if there if there's this heated exchange between Shatner Nimoy and Roddenberry, what what finally happened to appease them, to make them go, okay, well, fine, we'll we'll keep filming the episode. What he did was he trimmed it. And see, he may have had a commercial reason for wanting to do it, but he did make it work because twice in the scene, Spock does say he wore it to honor. Her. Right. So there was a reason for doing it, but Ruttenberry, as a writer of dialogue, could be heavy-handed. A little. And that's what happened here, is that he wrote it, but he just overwrote it. And when, when he trimmed it down, I have no problem with it, as it appears in this in the scene now. So it was supposed to be filmed on the first day, yeah. and then it, because of, of all the, the drama, it got moved to the third day. So... 
from what I was reading in, in Mark Cushman's book, These Are the Voyages, is that Roddenberry was late with the rewrites of the scene in the dining room. So you and Shatner and Nimoy um, kind of wrote the scene yourselves as you were shooting it. Is that? I don't, I don't remember that. You know, so I don't remember doing that. But do you remember getting the pages in from Roddenberry of finally to shoot the scene? Um, yeah, on the third day, and, and I, I, I do not remember. I just don't. Rem I don't remember that. You know, if if I didn't know what was going on, if I didn't know all this drama, especially that went on between Shatner and Nimoy and, and Roddenberry, I mean, I think the message is actually a really good one, and it's one that it's fans one, and and he makes it work by saying it giving him a reason for wearing it. I'm going to say two contra contradictory things about the Idic thing. The, <laughs> the first is, is that, and it sounds like particularly when they try to do it in Spock's brain, is trying to shoehorn something into a TV show in order for me to make money personally on merchandise on the side is not that cool. I also think that having known a lot of people who work, particularly I have a bunch of friends who work in animation, and the dis animation's all about selling merchandise, you know? So the discussion of how do I, you know, design this new gun or this new spaceship or, you know, the amount of discussion of the Millennium Falcon and how can we create another Millennium Falcon, that's normal to television. That's like a thing that just ha happens all the time, particularly even more so today. Um, I think it is put into the scene, it's okay. I don't think it's great, but it, it, I didn't, I never bumped on it until years later when I found out that this is what had happened. Like I, I never noticed it watching it and I didn't think it stood out. Well, Steve, did you notice in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, in Spock's quarters, when Spock goes, when Kirk goes to see Spock in his quarters and Spock is meditating, and, you know, Kirk says, we have a problem. There's something wrong with regular one. We got to go. You know, Kirk, and Spock tells, you, you should, never should have given up command. You could see behind Spock on the wall is a giant idic piece of art. So the answer is, of course, I never noticed until later when it was pointed out to me. No. <laughs> you know? So I knew about it now, but I never noticed when I first saw it. Going back to the days of live television, because this was very prevalent in television. There were people who would come to directors doing live television to get products like a coffee can, Maxwell House coffee. To, right. Television was doing that from the beginning. Yeah. And so that this thing with the idiot, it's a little different, but it's still it's just a part of really what was the conversation of the time. My guess, of course, Ralph, you were there and I certainly wasn't. But sometimes you get to the straw that breaks the camel's back. And in season three, my guess is that Shatner and Nimoy were just, this was the like the last straw for them. Well, if you, if you want to know what they were thinking, Steve, I'll tell you what they were thinking. William Shatner said, the show was getting sloppy. Our scripts were suffering and cancellation seemed the probability. It had become clear that Roddenberry drifted away from the show. And most disheartening of all were Roddenberry's blatant attempts to milk every possible cent from his dying cash cow, even at the expense of our scripts. Nimoy said, what bothered me most about this was my sense of loss in regard to Gene. If Gene was at his best and on his game, he could help you enormously with a script. But by this time, he had refocused his attention and his energies into helping his new merchandising company Lincoln Enterprises. Roddenberry, in defense of all this, said, I've heard the accusations that I abandoned the series, but that was not the case. I assigned many of those scripts and gave input, but I kept a low profile because I told NBC I would not produce the series if they put us on at 10 o'clock on Fridays, which is what happened. So I could not let anyone come to me with their problems. And some of them have since said that they felt abandoned. If I may say, when we did a deep dive on Britain circuses, and I said at that time, this is the beginning of the end of Star Trek. And yep. what we're seeing now is just what happened that started back then. Because all of this is because of the sale to Paramount, the, the tightening of the schedule, the lowering of the budget. I mean, this tension, it's a part of that. And for Roddenberry, who didn't have that good a 
relationship with the network to begin with. He had really created something totally different, had done it, and then had it being destroyed yeah. Yeah. bit by bit by bit. I recognize Roddenberry's flaws, but I also recognize his strengths. And I mean, even the strongest can be become discouraged when you were bumping your head against a, a wall that's not going to move. Yeah, that's why that's why F- Dorothy Fontana left. She was like, I went out, you know. And, and, and Bobby Justman. Yeah. So we sort of talked about the scene. Shall we actually get into this dinner scene? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I uh, the, it's going to be a deep, deep dive. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> so the um the first thing is is it's all it's interesting. It's all guys sitting at the table with Miranda. And the first kind of point of conversation is how can they let you do this? And the they is sort of they say the male population of the Federation. Didn't someone try and talk you out of it? Now that you ask, yes. Who did try to talk her out of it, Scott? Uh, I would say that would have been Larry Marvick. Larry Marvick. Um, again, that's a nice little piece of writing. And they say, and there's so much um, suave, old school gentlemanness in this scene. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad he didn't succeed. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met you. Thank you, Captain. Tell me, Dr. Jones, why isn't it dangerous for you to be with Carlos? Of course, later on, we're going to find out why, that it's because she's blind. (laughs) I like the joke, by the way, where Kirk says, Spock, I can understand. Nothing makes an impression on him. Why, thank you, Captain. (laughs) (laughs) It's almost as if if Gene Kuhn wrote it. Yeah, Yeah. parts of it does. Yeah, for sure. And this is where we hear that she spent four years on Vulcan. On Vulcan, I learned to do things impossible to learn anywhere else. To read minds. How not to read them, Captain. That is a fascinating line. Yeah, interesting. And what we hear is that because she was born a telepath, Vulcan was necessary to her sanity. What most humans generally find impossible to understand is the need to shut out the bedlam of other people's thoughts and emotions. Or of their own thoughts and emotions. My observation about this is that it's a dense screenplay. There's a lot of information from start to finish throughout the screenplay. I took more notes watching this episode than I did on any other deep dive we've done so far, Steve. And then we're, we're here we are at this moment, which I actually think, even though the Idic I pin and all that, I maybe doesn't work that well. I think this moment totally works. You know, I was just noticing your Vulcan Idic, Mr. Spock. Is it a reminder that as a Vulcan, you can mind link with the Medusans far better than I could? In other words, she takes that as, as something that he's holding over her in, in terms of getting a job. Right, right. That is a real, I, I'm sure both of you have dealt with people whose defenses were up like this all the time. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, because she, it's a job she really, I mean, four years she's been working to get it and it's still not set. Um, not arguing with you, Ralph, I, t- I totally agree. But it's the internal insecurity too. It's not just- oh, Of course. Yeah. It's not just, am I going to get this job? It's are people, am I going to be found out? Am I an imposter? Is everybody better? Are people judging me? It's all of those things. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I wear it this evening to honor you, Doctor. And then this is, you know, I was talking about good writing. This is bad writing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is Kirk says, yeah, It's very interesting. I might even say fascinating. But back to your mission, Doctor. Anytime someone has to say, but back to this or anyway and change the subject, that is bad writing. Good writing, we naturally flow from subject to subject. But but this is this is this is essential so that when we get to the point where Carlos has to save the day, we understand why he's the Absolutely. only one to save the day. We've got to get but, the exposition out. Right, yeah. The Medusans have superior navigating abilities for starships right. and their ability to solve navigational problems. So, you know, it's like remember this because. That's going to play a really important part in the Act Three. Yep. I don't care how benevolent the Medusans are supposed to be. Isn't it suicidal to deal with something ugly enough to drive man mad? Why do you do it? I see, Dr. McCoy, that you still subscribe to the outmoded notion promulgated by your ancient Greeks that what is good must also be beautiful. And the reverse, of course, that what is beautiful is automatically expected to be good. It's interesting to me that it's Larry that says that line. Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What is he saying when he says that about the reverse, that beautiful must be good? I think he's referring to Miranda being beautiful, but he's becoming resentful of the fact that she, he can't 
she can't return the love that he has for her. And he's, he's starting to resent that. Yep. Yep. And, and, and I think he loves her and hates her at this point. He's obsessed. We haven't gotten to it yet, but just before he leaves, he does rebuke them because he is not happy with the attention the men are all paying to her as a woman. Mm -hmm. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, I think most of us are, are attracted by beauty and repelled by ugliness, one of the last of our prejudices. Before we go on to the next part of this line, that is actually, in terms of evolution, that is what beauty is. Beauty is a thing that attracts us. That is why it exists. Yeah. That is its definition, really. And he's also speaking from experience about, you know, ugliness being the last of our prejudices, because when he first saw the Horda, he was repelled by it. When he first saw the Companion, he was kind of repelled by it. It wasn't until he realized the Horda was a mother protecting its young, her young, and that the companion was a female in love with the man that he realized he was wrong. So yep. even he in this, you know, this, uh, uh, even though he certainly was able to get into Styles' face and Balance of Terror and say, leave any bigotry in your quarters, he still has that last of the prejudices because he himself was repelled by ugliness. Right. Well, I mean, our own bigotry is the tough stuff to to spot, you know? Yep. It's hard to be aware of our own um, prejudices. But at the end of this, he says... At the risk of sounding prejudiced, gentlemen, here's to beauty. I think you staged this really well. I love the the, the shot of Miranda through the toast. <laughs> yes, I, I do too with the two classes. To Miranda Jones, the loveliest human ever to grace a starship. And they drink, and McCoy says in his wonderful old school sort of way. How can one so beautiful condemn herself to look upon ugliness the rest of her life? Well, we allow it, John. Certainly not. Thank you. I love Miranda Jones's reply. This, this line is, she's, we've had a great job of showing her insecurity and showing like the anxiousness about her and her competitiveness and jealousy. And this line shows why Miranda Jones is pretty awesome because she <laughs> says, how can one so full of joy and the love of life as you, doctor, condemn yourself to look upon disease and suffering for the rest of your life? Can we allow that, gentlemen? Yeah, it's a great line. And I think the character of Miranda yeah. is, is you know, definitely flawed. But also, you know, she's not your typical woman on Star Trek in the late 1960s. Like she she's on to Kirk, you know, when he when she tries to when he tries to romance her. She's courteous to McCoy's compliments. Yes. And he's down, she's downright dismissive uh, and cold to Marvick's love for her. Yes. And McCoy is lovely when he says, To whatever you want the most, Miranda. Then suddenly we have this musical moment. The camera pushes in on her. We have these uh, super impositions with the I ambassador. Mrs. Work, that, and that is so wrong. I was going to ask you that question. That's what I was wondering. When, when it pushes in on her, and her line is, There's somebody nearby thinking of murder. And of course, the somebody is Marvick. Right, right. And Collis has nothing to do with it. And that is, see, that, that's really giving misinformation. It does one of two things, and I completely agree, because I really don't like it too. Either it's saying that Collis has something to do with the murder, I mean, like in terms of he's a bad person or it's linking her telepathic powers to the Medusan ambassador, which isn't the case either. This no, has no. literally nothing it's to do with him. Wrong. It's yeah. Wrong. Yeah, I agree. I mean, of course, we know who it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not Kirk, Spock, McCoy or Scotty. We don't know that yet. Uh, I'm going to agree with both of you. One is we have no clues that it's Larry. And the other thing is I agree with Scott. We're pretty sure it's not Kirk, Spock, or Scotty, or McCoy. So, <laughs> well, Or, you know, it's, whatever. It, it comes so fleeting. Yeah. In other words, it comes and she senses murder and now it's gone. Yeah. And again, telepathically, where she has said earlier, to get rid of your, out of your mind what other people are thinking and what you're thinking. So that... Uh, she says good night, and I like that McCoy asks. Are you sure you're well enough to find your way along? Of course, Dr. McCoy. Please, don't worry about me. Does McCoy know she's blind already at this point? Oh, no. Yes. Does I, he? I, I think, I think, he I does. think he does. I think he does because... He might. He might. Yeah, because when we get to the moment 
where he tells her, you cannot fly the Enterprise. You know, you can do a lot, but you can't do that. He already knew. I think he knew now, but he was just, you know, respecting her privacy because clearly she did not want anyone else to know about yeah. this. Except this is the first time we've seen them together. Yes. It's a good question. My, my gut is, is that he does know because he says, are you well enough to find your way alone? Which is an odd way to phrase the line unless he knows. I always took that the fact that she is new to the starship. Sure. And this is a big, complicated structure with hallways and corridors. And for somebody just to board, because this is the first evening. She's only been here for this less than a day. I, I just took it for that. To me, and obviously uh, it might not be there, but to me, there's two choices. If I was talking to the actor, choice one is he does know, choice two is he doesn't know. Do, or choice one, he does know, to me, is the more interesting acting choice. Yeah. Okay. I think he knows. Now, where I come from, that's what we call a lady. Yeah, she is something special. Very special. I suggest you treat her accordingly. I've known Dr. Jones long enough to be aware of her remarkable gifts. It's an odd moment. Yes, for yeah. sure. It's filled with a lot of stuff. That what What is the stuff that you're reading into there, Steve? Well, first of all, there have been all these men paying attention to the woman that he loves. Right, that's, so he's jealous. That's the first one. And the second one is I think he's got very complicated mixed feelings about Miranda Jones. And now I love Scotty is so wanting to make buddies with Larry Marvick. Larry, would you like to stop off at engineering with me? I have a few things to check and... Uh... A bottle of scotch says that you can't handle the controls you designed. He's just not having it. <laughs> Some other time. For Scotty. Well, Larry, Larry knows where he's heading. But Larry has more important things on his mind, yeah. according, you know, as far as he's concerned, than hanging out with Scotty in engineering. Right. I genuinely intended to honor her, Captain. Why does he repeat it? Why do you think he, like, repeats it? Once Mar Mar Marvick leaves and we've got to get rid of everybody to get into the next scene... If you're trying to do it, giving each one of them something to say. And I, I think these are kind of made up lines just to get out of the scene. Right, right. I see. Sometimes you just have that. In other, in other words, the scene is really over. It's almost over when she leaves. Yeah. Or or when Marvick leaves. We need his line. But I think it's a, I, I, I do, obviously it is a transitional line and I totally get yeah. that, but I, I'm glad it exists. Because oh, oh, oh yeah, and, and you have to do it. And uh, but uh, sometimes when the lines don't work, you make them work. I've had the thing where you had someone lay into you, and then they leave, and you turn to your buddy and say, "Dude, I seriously, I was not, I didn't mean that." You know what I mean? Exactly. Like needing That's to defend myself. That's the purpose myself. of that line. That yeah. is the purpose of that line. Like like Spock is saying, guys, I I really did just mean to honor. Her. You know, I wasn't just saying that. And there's an odd moment with McCoy and Kirk after. What's troubling you with the girl? Well, she's not just another girl, Captain. Don't make that mistake. Oh, I didn't think that for a moment. What else? I don't know what it is exactly. She seems very vulnerable. We're all vulnerable in one way or another. A very sensitive line from Captain Kirk. I yes, think. it is. It's coy almost. But there's something so very disturbing about her. That's a strong line. So, this, like, disturbing, like, let's see, is he just noticing how closed off she is. I mean, what does he expect? She was on Vulcan for four years. I have a question for you, Ralph. At the very end of the scene, the camera goes to the to the flower, the rose on the table, which Kirk picks up. Whose idea was incorporating flowers so much into this episode? I don't know. It was just, I think it was... It was in the script or... I think it was in the script because I don't remember adding that. Because it's, nice, it's a nice touch. Yeah. it's You know, it's also a nice touch is that I'm pretty sure... You know, I stand corrected if anybody else noticed this uh, in another episode, but this is the first time that we've seen crew members of the Enterprise turning in for the night and wishing wishing each other good night. Okay. You know, like like we've never actually seen like like you know like what happens at the end of the day? Do they just say hey good night good night Captain good night Doctor McCoy yeah. good night Spock? I mean, there's a little <laughs> bit with Khan who grows fatigued. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I don't know. There, but yeah, I can't remember other places. We're in Miranda's quarters, and there's a buzz, and it's Larry. And at first, she doesn't want to let him in. He says it's important, and he comes in. This scene is, I, I it's a, it's remarkable to me that they hadn't really rehearsed this because and, and absolutely brilliantly photographed. Yeah. So this scene was moved up 
after the the mutiny of uh, of uh, Shatner and and Nimoy about the Idix scene. So Diana Muldaur and uh, David Frankham they kind of knew the lines. You know, they, they knew the scene. Lines. And then we and this scene is so so powerful, so well acted, so well okay. written, and so well executed. You would never know that that they they just suddenly were told, "Hey, that scene we we're going to shoot in a couple of days, we're going to do it right now." I mean, it's amazing. Well, as, as as I said, you know, their feelings that they would have preferred to do it before they had the night before, but. I can't imagine it being done better. I agree with that completely. I just yep. think this is a, it's a top-notch scene. And, you know, Steve, we talked, uh, we've talked elsewhere about scenes involving the guest stars where none of the regulars mm. are present that go on for quite some time. And this is one example, the scene between uh, uh, the Romulan commander and the Centurion on the Romulan ship is another mm-hmm. example where we spend an extended period of time away from any of our of our regular regular characters. But this scene is so powerful, and the cinematography in this scene is absolutely the best shot scene in all of the third season. The lighting mm-hmm. in the quarters is just absolutely peak Finnerman. And for one one moment, I felt like I was back in season two, is is, is how good this shot, this this scene is, the way it's shot, the way it's acted. It's it's just fantastic. And I think that because of the fact that it was coming so suddenly, we did take time to rehearse. Um it's also really well written. It's it's the kind oh, of a scene beautifully written. Because we get in this one little scene, we can see their whole relationship. Please, Miranda, don't go with Carlos. Now we've been over this time and time again. Don't I know? I've asked you in restaurants, in the laboratory, and one knee, on both knees. So we know where this has gone, and we can see, and Diana Muldaur plays this so well, because mm-hmm. you, you see all of her, I don't want to hurt this guy, I'm trying to be nice, you know, I really am uncomfortable with what's going on. Harry, please try to understand. I understand. That you're a woman and that I'm a man, one of your own kind. And that Cullis will never be able to give you anything like this. Here's what I have grown to love about this scene. Because this scene is, is, a, is one that I've come to understand and appreciate and relate to, which is why the overall episode is one that has grown on me over these years. And I've grown from liking it to really loving it. I mean, how many times in our life where we were just absolutely smitten in love with someone and we profess that love and that person initially is flattered and does her best to let us down without hurting our feelings, but we persist and we persist to the point where she gets cold and says, all right, enough. I'm not interested. That's where Miranda is right now. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm, I'm not interested. Stop bothering me. I'm going off with Carlos. And she may look like, be, like she's being really cold, but who knows how long Larry Marvick has been pursuing Miranda where she is now at the point where she's like, look, no more Miss, Miss Nice person. I got to, I got to be, you know, completely clear with you, I am not interested. Absolutely. Right on. Two quick things. I'll try to say them quickly. The first is, is that those people who have listened to the cinephiles know that the, I don't know, Ralph, if you know the term, the friend zone, but that is what this is, where some one person is a friend <laughs> yeah. and is in love with the other person and the other person doesn't want a romantic relationship. That's called being caught in the friend zone. So uh, my relationship to my wife I was in the friend zone for three years, begging her to have a relationship. And then eventually, strangely enough, we ended up getting married, which is not what usually happens. When I was teaching film school, I brought up this idea of the friend zone, and I was told something very different from the young people in my classes about what that meant and what they said. And it relates to this scene. They said, the friend zone is an abusive relationship. And I said, you mean that the object of the affection is being abusive to the person that's in love with them? And they went, no, no. It's the person who is in love. They are being abusive. 
mm-hmm. is, and I went, that is really interesting. And this is a perfect example yeah. of Larry is abusive to Miranda. He is using his love for her as a way of abuse. Mm-hmm. It's not, that's not abuse is in his intent necessarily. And particularly in this kiss, which, and of course it's 2022. And so we have ideas of me too, and th- things that didn't exist in 1968, but uh, the way it is played, she is absolutely cold. It is extremely clear that she is not into it. And he lays a very big aggressive kiss on her. And that is abuse, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I love as you see her face as he pulls away. Yeah. That look on her face is saying it. As if her words weren't enough. Yeah. And, and, and not only her look, but the way Jerry lit it. Again. Yeah. Oh my God, he's a, he's a genius. I've been honest with you. I simply cannot love you the way you want me to. Which reminds me of two of my favorite Paul Simon lines. One from Hearts and Bones, Why Can't You Love Me for Who I Am, Where I Am. And the other from, is it Gumshoes? Uh, which has another one that's very similar uh, from the Graceland album. Like that, that idea, she's like, no, I don't have that. I can't be what you want me to be. Hearts and Bones. It's my favorite Paul Simon song, by my, the way. My, one of my favorite albums of his, even more than the, the famous ones, uh, you know, Graceland and so on. Miranda. And I'm going away with Carlos. That's final. I think you'd better leave now. And then the music hits, and it's very intense, and she realizes it's him. So it's you. There again, and the superimposition of the box is yep. wrong. Yep, I agree. Who is it you want to kill, Larry? Is it me? You mustn't keep this to yourself. I want to help you. And he's like, now you want to help me, huh? Um, does she want to help him? Yeah. I think so, too. I think so, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Now I know what a mere human male has to do to get a reaction out of you. Make you think he's a patient. A great psychologist. Why don't you try being a woman for a change? Ouch. It's interesting in contrast with all the talk about she is a woman and why didn't the men convince you not to go with Kolos and that's a great woman and the toast to beauty and all of that stuff. I think that's directly connected to this. In it, this this is the negative side of that coin. You oh, know? That's why he was so uncomfortable watching yep. it at the table. He exits. He walks down the corridor with the camera following him and then he turns back. Can I interject something here? Of course. The- David came to visit me four, five, six years ago, and I took him to meet uh, to a friend who has a gallery, an art gallery, and he does have a big television screen on the wall where he can show things that he doesn't have room to hang on the wall. And we watched the show on that. Now, now David is severely impaired visually. Mm. So he, he was standing right up by the screen and Dave, David is a photographer, the other David, who owned the gallery, and he was taking pictures. And there was a picture of David Frankham looking at the screen at that moment where Marvick turns and then looks back so that the two Davids are looking at each other. It oh, is, wow. It is the most surreal. It, wow. I, I have it on my website for Is There in Truth No Beauty? I mean, it is just a miraculous shot. Wow. Wow. That must have been Very cool. cool. I mean, he's looking at him like, what What are you doing out there, old man? <laughs> David Frank at this point has white hair and, you know, he's, he's a man, an elderly man. And the two Davids are looking at each other. Wow. Go, go on the website and look at the picture. Definitely. We will. We, everybody listening, make sure you yeah. go to Ralph's website and look at the picture. He heads to the Medusa's quarters. He goes inside. The Medusa starts to open. He draws his phaser. This whole thing I find extremely stressful. Yes, disturbing. Is, is and, and, I, I use. and I wish that it, it, again. It I don't have the like, effects. I don't like all the other stuff. I would just like to see him. But he's great. He's great at losing his mind and being driven insane. Yeah. It's a, and it's a committed performance. To me, to me, it it casts a, a negative feeling about Kolos. Yes, I agree. I yeah, agree. It, it makes does. him a monster. It, it, it's like Colas is attacking him rather than his just responding to what he's seeing. Yep. Or he's defending himself because he knew well, I don't that. Think he's not even defending himself. Colas isn't doing anything. Yeah. Marvick was about to shoot him with a phaser. Huh? Yeah, but it but Colas didn't do anything to stop him. 
he just saw Kolos and that drove him insane. Yeah, right. Just seeing Kolos, which is doing it, but it looks like Kolos is defending himself by attacking him. It, it certainly brings the uh, act one to a, an extremely dramatic yeah. uh, conclusion with uh, Marvik being like completely losing his mind by by what he's seeing, and he's trapped in the room. He's you know he can't even like find his way to the to the the core the door to open the door and go out into the corridor, which is how we pick up at the beginning of Act Two. Right. And I gotta say, the the shot that you did following Marvik down the corridor. And into the transporter room. There, there aren't a lot of shots like that in the original series where it's like a walk and talk. Yeah. Uh, in this case, it's a walk and scream or a run and scream. Um, but, but was that a particularly challenging shot to do, following him down the corridor? Yeah. The thing I can't remember now is whether or not I did it with an eighteen millimeter or a nine. Because it's done with a wide shot. My gut would be it would be an 18 at this point because it doesn't se- seem quite as wide. Well, that, that's yeah. it, it. Dumping ahead. When she comes out to go go to his room, that is with a nine. That I remember. Uh, these are, we're talking about the kinds of lenses and the lower the number, the wider the lens for oh, those yes. people who are listening. Um, so he's stumbling through the corridor. Uh, we go back to uh, Miranda who... And by the way, I like at the end of Act Two when Miranda is aware, obviously, of what Larry is doing, that the way you did it was you pushed in on her and you brought a light up on her face at that moment. Yeah, there again, Jerry lighting as she turned and he brought Yeah, he yeah. Said, That's and, really nice. And she goes into the ambassador's room, picks up the phaser, and at the same time, Larry is heading into engineering and getting violent. And again, when she went into his room... The, the green flickering should not be there. Right, right. And we're in engineering and Scotty is thrilled because the guy he wanted to hang out with is here. And he's like, oh, good. Yeah, you can try out the controls and he's making <laughs> jokes. And So in the earlier versions of this teleplay, Marvik does not go to engineering. He goes to the bridge, knocks out a guard, uses his phaser to knock out two other guards on the bridge and gets into a struggle with Chekhov to change the course for the void outside the galactic barrier. Arthur Singer, who was the story editor, moved the action to engineering because a little later in the screenplay, we are going to have a fight on the bridge when Spock loses control and he didn't want to have two fights happening in the same exact place. Good, so good, I think yeah. it's much more dramatic, actually, yeah. with Marvick going to engineering. And it makes sense oh. because, you know, because of the because of what you pointed out about Scotty. An attempt was made to murder Ambassador Collis. The murderer is dangerously insane. He is Lawrence Marvick. And Scotty basically goes, oh, crap. It goes to grab him. <laughs> Ralph, talk about how you approached filming this fight scene. Nine millimeter, but not for everything. Only for his point of view. When you're shooting right. across him to, to the other. I think it's a very well done fight scene. I think it's great. And, and the thing I think, too, often when you're putting the camera as someone's POV and you have their arms reaching into frame, it always looks wrong to me. And this one doesn't. I think you did a great job of making the POV and the arms coming into frame really work well. I have a resistance to fight scenes for the stuntmen where you're back and you, and you literally can tell that it's done by a stuntman. This is where you're in the fight and it can get violent and get over quicker. Then they keep going on and on to the point where you think he shouldn't be able to keep going. I mean, he should be unconscious by now. I like the the fight scenes shorter, but make them as violent and exciting as you can. I have another question for it. I know you're not that involved in the post-production process in editing. Did you plan for the jump cuts? Because there are a bunch of jump cuts within this fight scene. We would have cut like that if on my cut oh sure yeah. because i love them i think those jump cuts are great oh yeah oh absolutely it was planned that, to be done that way that was the way it was in my cut so we're uh back on the bridge and there's a shake and suddenly we're going warp 8.5 and accelerating okay well what's interesting is the angle yes. of the shot on the bridge this is the only time you see this to particular point of view on the bridge mm-hmm. like it's coming from the turbo lift and you're looking towards Kirk, towards the view screen, and towards the right side uh, of, uh, I have to say, stage right, if you will, on the bridge. 
and you see Spock run towards his station. Why did you choose that particular angle to show the Enterprise going off course like that? Because, I mean, again, Spock was not at his post where he is so much of the time that you had to be there. And if he wasn't going to be there, and as, as a director, you you look for different ways to shoot. I mean, I'd, I'd shot the bridge in five different episodes already. And I didn't realize when I did it that it was different. And I didn't realize until I did my website that people pointed out that it's the only time it was ever done in the whole series. That's correct. That is correct. That's so many things like that, Ralph, the way it's like using the nine millimeter lens and so many inspired directorial choices that really elevate this episode and make it stand out. So we've passed warp nine and we're still accelerating. We finally raise engineering. And instead of hearing Scotty's voice, we hear Marvick say, We must have sleep. No sleep. They come into your dreams. That's the worst. They suffocate in your dreams. And we call security to engineering. I'll go with you. No. I must. I can reach his mind. They get down to engineering. You know, they grab him, restrain him. Scotty, where are we? I don't know. Beyond the boundaries of the galaxy. We made it. We're safe. This is the third time in three seasons that the Enterprise broke through the galactic barrier at the end of the galaxy. Of course, the first time was where no man has gone before. The second time wasn't by any other name. But because of where they are, they don't know where they are because they have no reference points. Right. And first, uh, McCoy is going to go, you know, sedate him or something. And he goes, no, no, Captain, we mustn't sleep. No, they come in your dreams. That's the worst. They suffocate in your dreams. And then he sees Miranda. As soon as he sees Miranda, David Frankham's performance, the range of his performance in only two acts is really extraordinary because even when he's completely insane like he is now. You don't lose your empathy for him. No. And when he sees Miranda, he just stops, like freezes in his tracks. And the, the love is there. But in a second, we're going to see what you've been pointing out, Steve, which is the hate. Well, and it starts, he's relieved to see her. Miranda, Miranda, you're here with me. And she's trying to be soothing with him. I'm here. I didn't lose you. Oh, my beautiful love, I thought I'd lost you. I'm here, Larry. Then you see this change in his face. No. I can see what he uh. sees. Uh. <laughs> no, don't. Don't think oh, of it. Liar. Deceiver, you're not alone. You brought it with you. It's here. It's here. You brought it with you. Liar! And he goes to strangle her. He goes from, like, like being in love with her to wanting to strangle her. Now, granted, he's a little insane because he looked at he looked at the Medusa ambassador with the naked eye, but this is exactly everything you pointed out, Steve, that he loves her and he hates her, and it's all coming to bear at the same time. Don't love her! Don't love her! She'll kill you if you love her! I love his, I love his performance in that. I love you, Miranda. <sighs> Unbelievable. He's like, he's like, don't love her. Don't love her. She'll kill you if you love her. And then he just stops and goes, I love you, Miranda. And just like has exhausted his entire life force. And wow. he is down. Un wow. Wow. Well, and I think about here we have this character, Miranda. We've already seen the levels of her insecurities and her jealousies and her desire to distance herself from people and distance herself from emotion and pushing him away. And now there's this dude saying, don't love her. You'll, she'll kill you if you love her. I mean, imagine having someone scream that at you uh, and, yeah. and then die. But does that make you hate Miranda at this point? No, no. I feel terrible for Miranda. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, Miranda's, a, she is a difficult character to love, yeah. you know, she's not easy, but I can still feel a lot of sympathy for her in this moment. Pussy and being afraid that he might take her job. And with Marvick, I mean, with everybody else, she's charming. She's charming with McCoy. She's mm -hmm. charming with, with Kirk. So when Marvick goes down, McCoy examines him and, you know, being in true McCoy fashion, doesn't try to resuscitate him or anything. He just says... He's dead, John. You know, the signature line. The look of pain on Kirk's face at this moment. You know, I got to tell you, you know, Ralph, before we did this episode, we covered two not very good episodes, and The Children Shall Lead and Spock's Brain. 
Uh, so, so doing this deep dive with you for what is a an amazing, beautiful episode is like really a palate cleanser. But Shatner was so over the top, especially in "And the Children Shall Lead." But when we get to your episode here, he's right back to being right on point. I think his performance in this episode is just absolutely terrific. I agree, I agree, and it, and it really does support sort of the observations that people have had for all these years, Steve, that when, when Shatner knew he had a bad script, he would, he would overact, he would lay it on too thick, but here he knows he has a good script. And also I've been meaning to ask you this question, Ralph, what do you think of George Dunning's score for, is there a true no beauty? The only place that I would change it would be those scenes with the green light where he's playing yeah. martial music for it needs just the opposite. But otherwise, no, it's stunning. His score for this episode is, it's cinematic. And we're back in Act 3, and the first thing we hear is that the Enterprise, we don't know where we are, and we don't know how we get back. A madman got us into this, and it's beginning to look as if only a madman can get us out. <laughs> and this is where we go back to the Medusans. And I think this is a good example of the plot elements and the story elements all working together. We're not in like separate A stories and B stories. Like this has been well set up and well planted that they I have mm -hmm. superior sensory ability and they might be able to see through all this. Perhaps for the purpose of this emergency, I might become Carlos. Explain. A fusion, a mind link to create a double entity. Each of us would enjoy the knowledge and sensory capabilities of both. And again, it's also been really set up that Spock was originally offered this job and that Miranda is jealous of his ability to maybe do this thing. So again, we're playing right into the tensions of the episode. Hazards? If the link is successful, there will be a tendency to lose separate identity. And then Spock says, very perceptively, Of course, Dr. Jones will not wish to give me permission to accomplish the mind link. Yeah, he's probably dreading even asking her, like, oh, yeah. great. I mean, like the last person who's going to want me to do this mm -hmm. and... And I have to get her approval. I could confine her to quarters. Already, I think this is a bad plan. Not sufficient. Her telepathic powers are formidable. If it is at all possible, her mind must be so engaged that no thought of what I am doing shall intrude. I think that could be arranged. Smooth operator. So I'm just going to say, I hate this. This is the one element of the episode. It's one thing. Okay, we've seen Kirk put his moves on people in other episodes in order to, to, to win at whatever he had to win at. But in all those other ones where there was conscience of the King or what little girls are made of, they're all enemies, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, they're all bad guys. This is not a bad guy that what they should do is they should go talk to Miranda. That is the correct, the moral ethical thing to do. Kirk can always do and do exactly what they end up doing later on. Go talk to Carlos and I'm going to order that this is what we're going to do. To go put moves on her, to distract her and betray her while Spock is doing a thing behind her back is not ethical, and I really dislike it. Yeah. Well, they, they they realize the hard way that they did do the wrong thing by doing yeah. this. But now, may I tell you my suspicions? Yes, sure. Because I, I just don't like the scene, period. Not only don't like the scene, but it's too long. Yeah, and it I'm is. I'm wondering whether it was done so that he would have as many lines as Leonard has. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. And getting to play the romantic stuff and oh, yeah, be the yeah. lead. And because I think it's, I think it's terrible. I really do. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, and I'm they, not a fan it, of the scene. And it, this just came to me, I think, yesterday, because of what I've learned while doing these, these dives about lines being cut. And Kirk doesn't have that much to do in this show. Yeah. I agree. Until the fourth act, it, it's really Leonard, Diana, and uh, David. Yeah, they, you're right. And I, uh, I wondered whether the scene might have been in to begin with, but it got worse as they lengthened it, you know, and added the move. I mean, it, it, it just it, it would not surprise work. me if that if that's how it played out for sure. Yeah. So we're in the arboretum. We're looking at flowers, and then he directs her to smell one, which she does, and gets hit by the thorn. And he says, as he takes her hand, I was hoping to make you forget about this today. And <laughs> excuse my language, Ralph, but this is where I wrote, this is all f 
fucked up. Oh, it is. <laughs> like a dude that was in love with her just died, went insane and died in front yeah. of her. And now like an hour later, you're trying to seduce her. Yeah. Like, I feel like I was thinking that too. It's really insensitive. It's yeah. terrible. And it's unnecessary too. I, mean, I agree. I didn't want his love. I couldn't return it. Someday. You'll want human love and companionship. Well, because also, this is just my opinion, but it's like, maybe she's not. Like, wh why? Well, she says she's not. She yeah. says, I see, com I see human companionship as a struggle. Yep. She likes being alone. Yeah. And it's like, that's okay. But then we do get into this, which is interesting. She says, At times, the emotions burst in on me. Hatred, desire, envy, pity. Pity is the worst of all. Now, I agree with the Vulcans. Violent emotion is a kind of insanity. I think that's interesting. I like this part of the scene. There are some lines and thoughts that are good, but yeah. just the overall is. Yeah. Well, and I think she's really good in the scene. Oh, absolutely. While this is going on, we intercut with Spock heading down the corridor with a visor. And Kirk is now pushing this idea of her avoiding human contact. And that's why she's going with the Medusans. Sooner or later, no matter how beautiful the minds are, you're going to yearn for someone who looks like yourself, someone who isn't ugly. That she finds that offensive. But she should. I do too. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I like her response. What is ugly? Who is to say whether Carlos is too ugly to bear or too beautiful to bear? I think that is a really good line. Yeah. Uh, that you know, there's some good lines in a scene that is overall not great. Maybe they they could have done away with his move on her and just use some of those lines and had, had a shorter three quarters of a, of a page scene. Yeah. Until she all of a sudden is aware of Spock. I mean, he walked, I think, through every corridor <laughs> just so we could have cutaways that would last long enough for this scene. I'll tell you what I do like about the scene. So I don't like the fact that we're doing the scene at all. But what I do like is the moment that she so clearly sees through him and gives him this really cold look as he's trying to be romantic. And she says, I see you're a very complicated man. I do like that. Calls him out. Yeah. It, that, that scene could have been trimmed down and just pick out the pieces and and, and, and use them to make a scene that, that, that could have worked. Right. It wouldn't have been long enough to bother. And then Spock enters the ambassador's quarters and right at that moment she knows Carlos, no Miranda. you mustn't let him do it Miranda, don't let me go Miranda. no you have don't. no idea what a dangerous thing spark is planning we must stop him and at this point kirk gives up and they head out and they get to the ambassador's quarters just as spock comes out the enterprise is at stake it is not possible for you to be involved so spock knows what's up now i've already committed myself to mind link when carlos and i reach the medusan vessel why put yourself in jeopardy? This is not a duty that you can assume. I am aware of the fact that your telepathic competence might be superior to mine. Let's pause there just for a sec. Does Spock think that she might be a better telepath than he is? I would take Spock as his word. Yes. Me too. I think so. I think he genuinely thinks that. Especially at this moment where the Enterprise is at stake. Yeah. Let's just cut to the chase here. She was a born telepath, and he's because he's only half Falcon. Right. Okay, Scott, this is super geeky. You know what just occurred to me? Tell me. We just went through the galactic barrier, right? Yep. How high is Miranda Jones's Esper rating? Wow. Yeah, why didn't she get zapped? She should have superpowers right now. She, she you know, she should have been zapped so hard she should have disintegrated. <laughs> I mean, she, this is we're referring to where no man has gone before, Ralph. Well, wait a minute. Do oh. telepathic abilities and Esper abilities are they the same thing? Well, Esper is ESP. So yeah, I would think that's in there. Well, if, if, ESP is not telepathy, t telepathy, no. It's extrasensory perception. It's, and, it's me sensing like what's around the corner. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, telepath. it doesn't mean I can read, uh, you know, I, I need. Connecting uh, to minds. Yeah. I need telepathic powers to be able to read your mind. ESP doesn't mean I can read your mind. Does it? I think it's it. That's in the list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and maybe, I, and I, maybe yeah, she I, have been I, zapped. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I can't. What's what's the doctor's name in uh, Where No Man Has Gone Before? Doctor Daner is that? A Doc, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Daner. Yeah. Doctor Daner, because she gives a list of people who have been able to see cards. I think she says read minds in that list of things that espers can do. Oh well, yeah. Then you're right. She should have been zapped. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, um, anyway. <laughs> the object is to pilot this ship. 
That is something you cannot do. Then teach me to operate the ship. I can memorize instantly. And McCoy says, Now, wait a minute. I realize that you can do almost anything a sighted person can do. And there's a reaction. But you can't pilot a starship. And the cat is out of the bag. So I do think that McCoy knew from very early on that she was blind. And I also respect McCoy immensely for respecting her privacy. Obviously, she doesn't want anybody to know, and he wasn't going to out her. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that Miranda is being told that she can't fly the Enterprise because she is blind. But in Star Trek The Next Generation, Jordi LaForge flew the Enterprise, and he had a like sensor that sounds a lot like the one that Miranda is wearing. Well, and it sounds like she pretty much can see. I mean, you know, her. I, I think she probably could fly the Enterprise. I also think, by the way, I wish that it was written slightly differently the way McCoy did this. I wish he first tried to talk her out of it without outing her and said, Miranda, you know that's, that's not a good idea mm -hmm. first. And give her the chance to back down and then out her. Um, rather than doing it right away. It's a right. totally nitpicky writing note, but that's what I would have done. And they realized that this cloak that she's been wearing is obviously a highly sophisticated sensor web. My compliments to you and to your dressmaker. May I add something here? Yes. In the party scene, she's wearing that outer garment, but the gown underneath it is blue with mm -hmm. shorts with bare arms. Now the garment is black. Mm -hmm. with black sleeves and at the end the, the final one she's wearing a green garment underneath and they're talking about why did you conceal this and kirk says i think i understand you said it pity is the worst of all pity which i hate and then she defends herself do you think you can gather more information with your eyes than i can with my sensors i could play tennis with you captain kirk I might even beat you. Scott, I'm with you. I was totally thinking about Jordy's visor uh, during this. <laughs> Say again? We're uh, talking about Jordy, who's one of the characters in Star Trek The Next oh. Generation, who has a visor that helps him see the way Miranda can see. And he and, and in the first season of The Next Generation, he was the helmsman. He was flying the Enterprise, and he was, you know, blind. <laughs> Mr. Spock will make the mind link. No other decision is possible. No. I won't let you. If we can't persuade you, there is someone who can. You'll have to take this up with Connors. And she goes inside, and Kirk asks McCoy why he didn't tell him. And he says, I respected her privacy, which is absolutely right. You're a doctor. You don't tell people about other about people's conditions without their permission. And then we hear a scream. Why do we hear a scream? That I don't know. I've... I hate the scream. I think it's ter I, I think it's totally wrong. I agree. Yeah, I'm um, not a fan of the scream. I don't know why why she had to why you had to have her scream. That could have been added in post production because yeah, mm -hmm. we certainly didn't do it while we were shooting it. She it's totally out of character for her. This is an incredibly controlled person. She's not going to just scream by doing it. It's just fitting in with the kind of things they were doing to kind yes. of jazz, jazz up. And I think this show had enough going for it that it didn't need to be jazzed up like that. Agreed. I hadn't put it all together, Ralph, until you said it. But the more I, it, it's it's all about turning Kolos into a monster. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's a mistake. Seems I have no choice but to obey you. And we're up on the bridge, and we've set up some sort of protective screen, which seems like pretty weak protection considering how dangerous Kolos seems to be. Well, I mean, it is paramount. The budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Spock has the visor. He goes behind this the screen, the, the thing opens up again, we have those lights, we have the music, and then Spock stands and comes out. And the other thing I was thinking about, Ralph, you got to direct Leonard Nimoy playing the most diverse sort of parts of anybody else. I know. They're all different. And his other character is not like any of the other, uh, other characters. And this time, it, there, there's something that is different before he was either Spock or the other. This time he's both at the same time. Right, that's right. And it's not the same as Happy Spock in This Side of Paradise, and it's yeah. not the same as the, as the bad guy in Return to Tomorrow. It's a, it's a new guy. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. And he's going it, it, back and forth. I mean, he'd be 
one character at one point. Well, but when we get to it, you'll you'll point it. We'll point it out. It, it, it's amazing because you're right. He's still Spock, but he's got this other person who's linked with him now, and this other person, Collis, is experiencing the senses really for the first time. This is delightful. I know you. All of you. And I'm able to 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 feel and to see and to hear and to smell. And Nimoy is fantastic. What was it like like filming Nimoy during for for this moment? Well, it, it like it was at all times. I mean, you just stage it and he does it. My relation to him was much like my relation to Jerry. Right. He's the actor. I stage it. We we just meshed. James Kirk, captain and friend for many years. And Leonard McCoy, (laughs) also of long acquaintance. And Uhura, whose name means freedom. Is that the first time we hear what her name actually means? Yes, it sure is. She walks in beauty like the night. That's not Spock. Are you surprised to find that I've read Byron, Doctor? That's Spock. And there's where he does the two, one character and then the other, just like that. Just like that. And by the way, the, the line that he's referring to comes from Lord Byron's 1814 poem, which is called She Walks in Beauty. And it was the first line of that poem. And then he sees Miranda. Ah, Miranda. I'm a brave new world that has such creatures in it. It is new to thee. They are quoting Shakespeare from Act 5, Scene 1 of The Tempest, in which... Uh, Miranda is actually named after Prospero's virginal daughter from that play. The actual line that comes from The Tempest is, oh, brave new world that has such people in it, uh, to which the reply is, tis new to thee. But again, the, the, the performances here, the, the way that Nimoy shifts just like on a beat and the the, the music is... I. This is one of those scenes where every time I watch it, I, it just really is so deeply moving. I agree. I agree. My world is next for us. Beautiful moment. Like that yeah. is that is so beautiful and obviously very poetic. And reassuring for this character, Miranda, who's so insecure about her position. Yes. This is this is going, no, no, we're I know I'm linking with this other guy right now, but my world is next for us. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. And then he says, formally, Captain Kirk, I speak for all of us you call Medusans. I am sorry for the trouble I've brought to your ship. This is where Kirk is like back to being that really good captain that we haven't seen for a few episodes. (laughs) Um, He says, We don't hold you to blame for what happened and thank you now for your help. And now to the business at hand. And so he sits down at the helm, does some stuff. There's Scotty's down in engineering. We have a lightning effect. And hey, we're back. Back in our galaxy. And uh, Chekhov is reading uh, his readings, and they're so close to the point where they left. Bullseye, Mr. Spock. Thank you, Mr. Chekhov. I think that the Westheimer stuff, when they were out there in that in this other place, I, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, the, so the Westheimer company did the visual effects yeah, showing I, the Enterprise in the void. And I agree with you. This, that, that, look, that whole blue thing, have they, have they ever done that before? Not to the extent that we see it in this episode. They did go through the barrier before, and the, the shots of the Enterprise entering the barrier and sort of being thrown out of the barrier were actually stock shots that were used in, well, it was filmed for Where No Man Has Gone Before, and the stock shot was used in uh, in by any other name, and they used it again for here. But the composite shot of the Enterprise with the, the background was done by the Westheimer Company specifically for this episode. Oh, it's awfully good. It's beautiful. And as good as Nimoy was in those first moments as the ambassador, I think these next moments are even better. Yeah. Where he stops, he touches his body and says, How compact your bodies are. And what a variety of senses you have. This thing you call language, though, most remarkable. You depend on it. For so very much, but is any one of you really its master? I had some deep stuff right there. Sure oh, is, and that smile on his face, which is—he didn't even smile like that in Paradise. Yeah, 
then the very next line, the smile fades yeah. because of the loneliness what? Yes. that well, being a person, a human is. Well, and remember, you know, I said before about bad writing is where you're forcing a transition. This mm -hmm. is the opposite because this idea of you depend on language for so much, but is anyone really its master? And that to me is the limits of language that humans... We are, it's really hard to actually really communicate with this kind of wonky thing we use called language, and that leads him to the thought of human loneliness. The aloneness. You are so alone. You live out your lives in this shell of flesh, self-contained, separate. And now he's starting to lose it. How lonely you are. When Spock was nominated for his third Emmy for season three of Star Trek, they must have played this scene as his figure consideration moment. <laughs> there you go. And Kirk very gently says, Ambassador, you must dissolve the link. And again, this has been well planted because what did Spock say the hazard was? That we would become too entwined with the two personalities, which is what's going to lead him to make this big mistake. So soon. There must be no delay. You're wise, Captain. And he walks back over behind the thing, and he kneels. He's not wearing that visor. And as the thing starts to open, Sulu notices the visor on the helm. Captain! Spock! Don't look! Cover your eyes! And that is the end of Act 3. Wow. Powerful act. That is an amazing act. Amazing, like great writing and really, really superb acting. So we come in to act four. The first thing we hear is a skin churling scream. The only other time, Steve, that I can think of where we heard Spock scream in agony like that was in Star Trek, the motion picture when he gave the mind meld to the mm. giant Ilea when he was in a spacesuit. That's the only one I can think of, yeah. Yep. And McCoy, immediately, being the doctor, wants to go. And Kirk, wisely, says, don't move. Don't move. Jim, no one is to move. Spock, are you all right? And Spock stands up. And he's not all right. Let, let me point out here that he stands up and sort of backs up, and he's, he's turned away. Then he turns into his face. So to see his face, then his face changes and becomes even more pained. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. 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 And then we go back to that use of that fisheye lens. Um, and I love them coming, trying, you know, reaching their hands out, trying to calm him down. And then we get into a fight. He tosses Kirk. He hits Bones. He throws both Chekhov and Sulu, knocks down some red guys. And finally, Kirk gets a phaser and stuns him. What was it like filming this the fight scene, especially with the with same, the, same as in engineering? In engineering, yeah, the, the nine millimeter for the point for the point of view. It's so it's so well done. It's you know this and the engineering fight in this uh, in this episode. There's no other fight scene or a combat scene that's like it in in Star Trek. Rather, yeah. in sick bay, we see Miranda is with him, no longer wearing the cloak. Again, for the scene. Bill Tice, who, who dressed her, when she takes off, she has the black dress with the long sleeves on, mm -hmm. which is all right for the scene. We're out in the corridor. Unless Miranda can look down into his mind and turn it outward to us, we will lose Spock. It's interesting to watch Kirk be scared, really scared at this moment for his friend in the corridor. She tried to help Marvick. Marvick is dead. That's different. Marvick loved her. And Spock is a rival. Is that any better? Yeah. And Kirk makes the decision to go in. Whatever happens, Bones, don't interfere. And he goes in, and she asks who it is, because without her cloak, she's fully blind. Yep. And he doesn't answer for a while. He takes a moment yeah. to pick up and realize that she's not wearing it. I have no news for you, Captain. No change. Only that his life processes are ebbing. What are you doing about it? Why, what I can, of course. Which doesn't seem to be much. So 
this is a really interesting scene for a lot of reasons, I think. Because first she's just defensive and he's pushing her. No doubt you think I can wake him with a kiss. It's worth a try, isn't it? After all, he's not a machine. But he is a Vulcan. Only a half. The other half is human. Far more human than you, apparently. What's Kirk thinking, I guess, is my question here. I think, well, first of all, I, I really like this scene. I think the two of them, Shatner and Baldauer, are terrific together. The power of the performances, I mean, it may be a little, you know, theatrical, but that's what I like about it. And Kirk knows that Miranda is jealous of Spock. Kirk suspects that Miranda sees this as an opportunity to get rid of him. And I think that if she really wanted to help him, that she would have done that already. She would have done what she's about to do without needing the, uh, the motivation from Kirk. But Kirk suspects all this. And I think he is deliberately pushing her buttons to make her see in a last ditch attempt, because he's got nothing to lose, to make her see that, that she is so deeply flawed that, that the ugliness, as he says, is within her as a way to snap her out of it so they can she can realize her true potential as a you know human that is basically shed herself of emotion and worthy of getting that link with Collis that she desires so much absolutely so i think that everything you said is exactly what is happening in the scene and i've started to interpret it slightly differently how I'm, so well so let me ask you this question first he says, he, he says, if you don't reach him soon, he'll die. But that's what you want, isn't it? That's a lie. Oh, yes, it is. You want him to die. And later on, he says, what did you do to him on the bridge? Did you make him forget to put the visor over his eyes? You're insane. Yes, you know your rival, don't you? Did she do that? Did she make him forget to put the visor over no, his eyes? No, I don't think so. I don't think but so I either. Think, but, but I think that he's just. Does Kirk think that she did that? No, I don't think, I think, he, okay. no, I don't think he does. All right. So this I is think the, he's just pushing her buttons. Yes. So this is what I, so this is the slightly different interpretation I have. And this is what I, why I find a really interesting scene. Have you ever had a situation where someone came in and criticized you and they were, they were not fair and they were wrong and it made you mad. And then you went and did the thing that they were criticizing you about way better than you were doing it before out of anger and spite. Do you understand what sure. I mean? Absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. And I, I can, definitely have. I, I like, yeah, I, I was basically someone was pushing my buttons and in retaliation, I responded doing it better than I thought I could have done it just yes. to prove my point And then some, yes, that is, I've had that a lot. I've gotten notes on a script or a project that were mean and insulting and wrong. And I went, and I was I'll mad, show you. and I'll go, I'll show you. And so mm -hmm. even though they were wrong, their doing this thing made me do a job better than I would have done had they not been that way. And that is exactly what Kirk is doing here. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I see, is that it's not that he thinks that she was trying to kill him, and it's not that she thinks, is that, but he is exposing definitely true things about her. Yes. And it is making, and I don't think she was really digging deep because of her own issues and insecurities and all this stuff. And I think and she's, she's got lots of yeah, them. Yeah. And she's got, she's going to say something about this in the final scene in the transporter room. You couldn't keep him from making a mind link with Carlos, something that you couldn't do yourself. And she tries to get away and he grabs her and says, with my words, I'll make you hear such ugliness. That Spock saw when he looked at Carlos with his naked eyes. The ugliness is within you. It's a lie. And so even though I don't think she was ever trying to kill Spock, and even though I don't think she made him lose the visor, I do think that ugliness is in her. For sure it is. I yes. mean, she's been showing that ugliness since the mo almost the moment she got, she stepped aboard the Enterprise. Liar! No passion to see Collis's madness. You can never see, never. But Spock saw Collis. And for that, he must die. Sadistic, filthy liar! He's not, she, he's not lying. She knows he's right. I mean... Kirk 
knows her right now better than she really even knows herself. It's, I don't think she's going, oh, Spock ca- called Kolos, now he must die, consciously. She's not having that thought. Exactly, right. But she's not, not conscious. But she is not doing everything in her power to save Spock either. And her jealousy and her insecurities is part of that. Smell of hatred. The stench of jealousy permeates you. Why don't you strangle him while he lies there? Don't say any more, Colos knows what's in your heart. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to Colos. Please go away. Ralph, what, what is your memory of filming this scene with Diana Muldaur and William Shatner? Because I, I think they're Again, superb. When you get two pros like that, they don't come in to see, well, now what are we going to do? They come in knowing what they're going to do. And then when they play against each other, each one charges the other. I mean, they, they, they interlock. I mean, they're, they're, they're really interlocked in it. And they're just, they're playing it. Yeah, they really are. And the most interesting thing in the scene to me is when she says, go away, Kirk's backing up out of the room. He does not look like confident Kirk. No, he's not. Oh, no. When he comes out of it, he says, he, that, he, he tells McCoy. You may be right, Pons. Maybe I shouldn't have gone in. Because I think what he what happened, and this is what makes this totally unique in all of Star Trek, Kirk's always going to make a bold move. That's who Captain Kirk is. I come up with a plan, and I'm aggressively going to go after the thing. And that is what he did here. And for the first time, he's not sure that that was the right move. Right. But also, Steve, as you, as you pointed out many times, Kirk is a is a supreme observer, and he's mm-hmm. been observing Miranda yep. the moment she stepped on the Enterprise. So the, the way he's backing out, I think he realizes that he pushed her too far. And either yep. one of two things are going to happen. Either she's going to really help him, or Spock is Spock is in serious trouble. Well, well I and, think he's coming out worried that that Spock is in trouble. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't know we don't he doesn't know what would have happened if he hadn't gone in there. You know, maybe he did exactly. I mean, I, we, I'm sure we've all done this where maybe I made the wrong move. You know, I said the wrong thing. Absolutely. She was blind, really blind, really in the dark. And if he dies, if he dies, how do I know that I didn't kill him? How do I know that she can stand to hear the truth? That's more vulnerability than we normally see in Kirk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Here's my question. The next shot we have is Miranda near the door. Is she listening to their voices and or reading their minds at this moment? I think the second. I think the second. Uh, I think those those bulkheads are pretty soundproof. So, but, but she I do is, think that she's. I do think that she is absolutely hearing their words. She goes back to the bed and says, "No, Spock. This is to the death." Or to life for both of us. I love that. I love it. Yep. That's to a great death moment. Or to the life. Well, and because this, it's so funny going, because I was thinking about going back to the first season where you have Bailey go on a journey. This is her journey. Like, this is where we had a lot in the first season of a supporting character has a full character arc. Mm-hmm. And this is what she has to do to resolve her arc. And I like the use of, again, those wide angles and the jump cuts. But on the jump cuts, I wish that they had limited them to things that had involved Spock. Oh, and not... Because it's his mind. And right. the, the, the shots of the box, the, there are shots of other scenes that he was not involved in. I think this this was bad editing. Oh, oh. Gotcha. But, but what I do like is the fish angle lens of, of Miranda melting Spock, and then Spock comes to and he goes right back and he melts Miranda. And it's scary. The first moment of that to me is scary. Yeah. And then he looks, he looks mad when he does it. At this point, he is mad from having seen Collis. And then there's that moment where you see his eyes clear. That's Leonard. I mean, he, he doesn't miss a beat. No, he's great. He's fantastic. And the door opens and you see Spock stumble out and they help him. You look like you've paid a visit to the devil himself, Miranda. And Kirk goes out to look for Miranda, and she's gone. Why was the nine millimeter lens used for that moment? Just to make the corridor look bigger. It did. It's later on. We're back in the transporter room. Uh, Miranda enters, and we hear, "We come to the end of an eventful trip, Captain." I didn't think you'd even talk to me. Well, I have you to thank for my future. So I think she's sort of resolved that. 
You know what I mean? Yes. With Kirk. Yes. And, and is there in truth no beauty? He has made her see the truth and it's beautiful. Wow. Yes. Right. I, I, I'm just pausing for a second, Ralph, because now I have to think about that more. Because I think it's a really interesting turn on the difference between, well, if it's beautiful, that must be good, as opposed to if it's true, it must be beautiful. Well, he has made her simply see the truth. Which is what she says. Your words enabled me to see. And he hands her a rose. I suppose it has thorns. I never met a rose that didn't. I, I love that line. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a great line. <laughs> I know now the great joy you felt when you joined minds with colors. Which is so great because that's free of jealousy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's not angry that he did this. It was like, right. oh, that was great. I rejoice in your knowledge and in your achievement. I understand, Mr. Spock. The glory of creation is in its infinite diversity. And the ways our differences combine to create meaning and beauty. Those beautiful lines. Yes. The glory of creation is in its infinite diversity. And then Spock responds, and in the ways our differences combine to create meaning and beauty. It's yeah. poetic. And, 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 and you've got George Dunning's score playing through all of this, Ralph. And again, I had not seen this episode in a while, but I found myself really overcome with emotion again, watching it like I did the other day. They give each other the Vulcan salute. Peace and long life, Spock. Live long and prosper, Miranda. Spock puts on the visor. And for some reason, Kirk can now be in the transporter room when we beam the ambassador, which we weren't allowed that, to do at the beginning. That's fi the final insult. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered whether it was Fabian, the editor, who, or whether Bill had a say in that. He says, you know, to her piece, which I thought was a, a beautiful and but, very appropriate. But earlier he had said peace and left. Right. I mean, which is the way we staged it. So you did you shoot him leaving? Oh, of course. That So so you shot him leaving I, I, and the I, editor I, left him in. What happens is after, after Miranda beams off, then you see Kirk exit the transporter room. That exit should have come before. Before. They they put before they beamed down. Put the visors on and did the leaving. Oh, absolutely! It's the way, it's the way it was written and it's the way we shot it. It's so dumb. I wonder why they did it. It's bizarre. Well, again, yeah. I don't know whether it was the editor, whether it was Bill, but eventually, whoever it was, it's the producer who has the final say. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a little sloppy. It seems more to me like a mess up than it than a Shatner wanting you know five more seconds of screen time. You know what I mean? Like because it, it, it doesn't really matter in terms if he had if you'd had the shot of him exiting well, before versus after. I don't think it doesn't really matter. Well, whether it was more time or just that, let's have the show end on me rather than on Spock. That's real petty. If that one's if that's the case, well, I, I think it's just you know it, you know it was an oversight. You know, they, it wasn't an oversight. Clearly, clearly, it was a decision because it was cut the other way and they changed it. So oh, okay. It a, oh, oh, okay, gotcha. Oh, but my cut, it, the the exit was where it should have been. Interesting. So it was deliberately moved. And they moved it, and mm. I don't, don't know who moved it. Not sure who, but shame. And as a matter of fact, on my website, when I did that, when I got to this moment, I said, "I've run out of scorn." <laughs> Well, this, the score again, George Dunning's score really takes the episode out. Uh, it is just such a beautiful theme. And uh, the writer of this episode, Jean Lissette Arrest, really, first of all, knowing that she was a librarian, no wonder she quoted Byron and, and Herbert and, you know, Shakespeare in this, in just one episode, I mean, she clearly knows her literary uh, greats. She said, "The thing about Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, it's like sort of like the Elizabethan idea of the human being. There's the animal mind, which has emotions in it. Then there is the rational mind, and then there is the will. Those three characters embodied that oh. McCoy being concerned with the body and also with the emotions." Uh, was sort of the animal. Spock was the rational. 
and Kirk was the will. She, she got these guys. She really, really did. And then closing out with what Jerry Finnerman has said, my favorite director was Ralph Sinensky. I always found Ralph to be the most sensitive. He did two or three shows where I thought the directing was just wonderful. It reminded me of the old days in features. That's Jerry Finnerman about Ralph Sinensky. I've heard that on his archive, television archive interview. But I've one thing I have missed telling you, somewhere midway through this, one day, and I don't even remember which scene, what we were doing, probably the third or fourth day, and he lit a scene, and I went to him and I said, Jerry, have they been talking to you? And he said, yeah, they called because they're a little concerned about, you know, the, the half a day behind. I said, Jerry, I want you to go back to lighting the way you did. I don't want to change it because of their error. I mean, it's because of their mistake, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to screw up this show like that. So go back to lighting like you did. Well, he obviously heard you because oh, oh absolutely. He, that's, that's why he said what he what he said. I think on the television the interview, uh, he also said I liked him because he didn't believe in compromise, and I did, I like I believed in compromise, but but not if I'm compromising because of somebody else's screw up. Well, this particular episode, it is such a standout. And yeah, there was definitely some drama there with the Idic and, you know, Shatner and Nimoy not wanting to film and everything like that. But when you look at the final cut and you look at the finished episode and it is so powerful and so beautiful. So are you able to look at is there in truth no beauty now and appreciate oh, oh, I, it for the I, I think it's I think it's fine. It's more than fine. I admire the script, admire the performances, I admire the the, the the photography. I think Jerry's photography is as usual, except I think it's even more exciting than usual. Steve, how about you? What's your what's your take after this conversation? So I don't think it's a perfect episode. And I think, uh, Ralph, you pointed out some of the reasons that I hadn't picked up on before of, of, of why, which is some of those things with the ambassador. But I do think in a weird way, it goes back to some of those things I loved about the first season, in particular, having a flawed character, a flawed guest character as the central person who has to go on a real journey. And the ideas that we're dealing with are really sophisticated and subtle and ones that you know, this is the kind of episode where you can go back again and again and go, well, what is happening with Miranda? What is she really feeling? What is Kirk's motivation? What does it mean to be so ugly that you can't, we can't look at it without going mad? And maybe it is that they are so beautiful that we can't bear them. And maybe that does change us in our way that we think about ugliness and beauty and goodness and evil, and in particular, truth, which is what we're trying to get to, is that somehow we're on a journey to find truth. Uh, I find it to be a, a, an episode that gives back more and more the more that I watch it. I completely agree. And I, I absolutely love your assessment on it, Steve. This is definitely another one of those episodes that I have grown to love over, over these years. And after this conversation, I feel like I've grown to love it more. I feel like I want to go back and watch it again after processing this deep dive conversation. I mean, Ralph. Uh, I can't thank you enough again for joining us for almost three hours to talk about your sixth Star Trek episode yeah. and for, for joining us all of these times for the side of paradise, metamorphosis, bread and circuses, obsession, a return to tomorrow. And now is there in truth, no beauty, but you know what? I mean, never before has there been a situation where uh, any of the directors from Star Trek had done like a real like deconstructive breakdown of their episodes, like the ones that you have given us. And this has not only been a, a massive education and an honor, but as a longtime lifelong fan, it has been the epitome of a dream come true. So, so we really, really cannot thank you enough. Well, and I thank you because this has been great to go back and, and do this you know, from 55 years ago. And it has helped me under, to understand why Star Trek survived and became what it became. I like what it started as more than 
what it became, but I do understand, just understand it all now. And that, that's better. Do you think that doing these conversations with us? Oh, absolutely. It has helped you? I'm saying yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I mean, that that's certainly the takeaway that we we oh. want you to have is that that even when things got a little rough, that, you know, the the certainly the love and appreciation Steve and I are 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 discussing with you and certainly the reactions that the fans have been talking about on our Facebook page, uh, you know, just shows you how much these episodes mean to all of us. And I really think that with what we've done today, that fans are going to see this. This show like Metamorphosis, I'm not sure has had the reception that we're like Metamorphosis, that it, it's it been underrated and under not, not that well understood. And I think that what we've done today is going to make people looking at it again saying, oh. Well, that's certainly the goal. <laughs> it's oh, certainly yeah. what we want people to do. Uh, so... That is what we think of Is There in Truth No Beauty? Of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts on our Facebook page. Just do a search for Enterprise Incidents. You can follow the show on Twitter at Enter Incidents, on Instagram at Enterprise Incidents. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, and please leave your reviews there. And if you want to find me, you can do it at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And since we're talking to one of our absolute favorite guests on Enterprise Incidents, I thought I'd mention some of the episodes from one of our favorite guests on The Cinephiles, which is the the great Scott Mance has joined us for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 2001 A Space Odyssey, one of the funniest movies of all time, Airplane. You can't have Scott Mance conversations without talking about the Beatles, and so we did A Hard Day's Night. And of course, three Star Trek films, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Wrath of Khan, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, all with my good friend Scott Mance. Scott, how would people find you? I, I got to tell you, the, every single one of those conversations with you and and John Roca, who is your your uh, co-host on the Cinephiles, uh, is has been one for the books. I can't wait for the next one. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance, and you can also be sure to go to our Apple Podcast page and leave a review for us. Those reviews especially the five-star reviews, are really, really important. Also, make sure you are following us on, on Facebook because we love engaging with you on our Facebook page. The conversations and the comments led by our enterprisers, our listeners, have just been such a joy to respond to. And Ralph Sinetsky is one of our enterprisers. He comments all the time on our Facebook page. And Steve, there is one other way that fans can support us on Anchor. And what is that? Uh, it is all you have to do is go to the show notes on a podcast, however you get it, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or Stitcher, you'll see some notes. There's a link to Anchor where you can subscribe to the show for as little as 99 cents a month. Um, and we definitely could use the support. Just think of it like a tip jar. If you enjoyed your meal of Enterprise Incidents, maybe put a little 99 cent tip in the jar. That helps us out to make the show. And Ralph, where can people find your website? At Saninsky.com or just Google Ralph's Cinema Trek, and that'll take you there. And ladies and gentlemen, everyone listening, if you want a true, truly joyful experience reading about the career of a legendary filmmaker and director. This is one website. You got to read all of it, not just the Star Trek stuff, but Ralph Sinensky has directed more than 200 hours of television over his incredible career. And it is really, really a beauty. No pun intended with the title of this episode to behold. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, the truth. Uh, it is absolutely <laughs> the truth. So says Ralph himself. Thank you all so much for joining us on this episode of Enterprise Incidents. On our very next voyage, we go to one that is beloved or reviled. It is uh, definitely a love it or hated episode, but I love it. Steve, what do you think of the empath? It makes me very uncomfortable, but I don't dis I don't think it's bad, but I don't necessarily enjoy watching it. Well, they're just right then and there, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, you're going to want to join us for what's sure to be a very engaging conversation about the empath. That is next on Enterprise Incidents. Until then, keep going boldly.